Jose Karen and Mayor O'Brien. We're live on YouTube. Welcome to the City of Burlingame uh, City Council meeting on March 1st, 2021. We will start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. Can I have Council Member Colson lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Of course. Can you stand up? Yes, we are. I know I'm short, but I am standing. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it which stands, stands, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. all. Okay, Megan, can we have roll call, please? Council Member Beach? Here. Council Member Colson? Here. Council Member Brownrigg? Present. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Present. Mayor O'Brien? Here. Uh, we, do, we did not have closed session uh, this evening, so there will not be a report out. So I will go right into uh, upcoming events. Uh, we have the teens teach basics of day-to-day -day technology. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to the burlingame.libcal.com or call 558-7400. I know there was a session today, but the second session is on the 8th of March. On March 13th, um, which is Saturday, 5 to 8, there will be the Washington Park um, event, uh, semi-formal attire uh, with live performances and music. If you want to register, you can go to registration.burlingame.org. We are going to have a St. Patrick's Day car parade uh, this year. That should be fun and exciting. I know a lot of people enjoy the Halloween parade. So I thank the Park and Rec Department for putting this together. Uh, and that will be on the 17th of March. You register through www.burlingame.org slash St. Pat's, or you can call 558-7300. And those are my events. Um, does anyone want to add anything? Okay, if not, then we are um, going to go into presentations. We have actually three presentations today. Um, so we are gonna start with the proclamation honoring Rosalie O'Mahony. Do we have her on the line? She is here on the attendees list. Perfect. Megan, do you wanna promote? Do you wanna promote her to Mahoney? panelists? Just did. Great. So Rosalie, you can go ahead and Unmute and start video. I'm not seeing her on my screen. She needs to uh, start her video and unmute herself. Okay. Oh, she's almost here. You may want to just go ahead and read Maybe the proclamation. Maybe I'll start with the proclamation. Okay. Well, there she goes. So I uh, welcome our five-time uh, for former mayor of uh, City of Burlingame. I'm actually going to read this proclamation um, as a thank you to all your work uh, on Bosqua, which is the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. Whereas former mayor and council member Rosalie M. O'Mahony has represented the city of Burlingame as a founding member and director on the board of the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency, otherwise known as BOSCA, since the establishment in 2004. And whereas Ms. O'Mahony also served on the board of the affiliated Bay Area Regional Water System Financing Authority, otherwise known as RFA, which was formed to raise money as needed to help rebuild the San Francisco regional water sy system. And whereas during her time on Bosqua and FRA, 
Ms. O'Mahony worked to ensure the critical improvements were made to the Hetch Hetchy Regional Water System so that Burlingame and all Abasqua member agencies would have a reliable supply of safe, high quality drinking water. And whereas Ms. O'Mahony has decided to retire from both Bosqua and RFA boards after a long and successful tenure. Whereas in addition to her work on Bosqua and RFA boards, Ms. Mahoney was a member of the Burlingame City Council from 1989 to 2009, serving as mayor 1994, 1997, 2000, 2004, and 2008. And whereas while serving on the city council, Ms. O'Mahony represented the city of Burlingame and San Mateo County on various regional transportation boards, including the San Mateo County Transportation Authority and the San Mateo City County Association of Government and brought hundreds of millions of dollars in funding for regional transportation infrastructure in San Mateo County. And whereas the entire Burlingame community is indebted to Ms. O'Mahony for her many contributions over the years to make Burlingame the wonderful city as it is. Now, therefore, I, Ann O'Brien Keegren, Mayor of City of Burlingame, do hereby proclaim the honor and recognition and appreciation to Rosalie M. O'Mahony for her service in the City of Burlingame. Um, I just want to add that you have been a tremendous asset to the City of Burlingame. And as we knew you years back, you were the infrastructure queen. Um, and I know you worked very closely with Saya Martusa and George Bagdon in the past. And I commend you for all the endless hours you have put um, toward this community. So I, uh, I want to know actually first, um, Rosalie, would you like to say a few words before I have my colleagues make some comments? Yes, yes, Mayor. Very good, go ahead. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity <coughs> to serve the city of Burning Game <coughs> on Bosca. <coughs> it was formed in 2003 on the passage of Assemblyman Papin's legislation, 1853, to preserve the water rights of a uh, Bay Area, the nine Bay Area counties under the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, thereby succeeding the power of the Bay Area Water Users Association, uh, BAWUA. Now more than ever, <laughs> water issues are getting more challenging in this new century, coupled with population growth, climate change, and well-financed environmental forces uh, competing uh, for uh, our uh, water uses. Uh, we want to uh, more than ever uh, realize that if we don't protect our uh, citizens' water rights and ensure that our Birmingham residents and businesses continue to have a sufficient water supply, we will be deficient and have let down our people. Now we are threatened with reduced water supplies and increased unit costs here in Birmingham and in the other agencies that are part of the PUC. I therefore recommend uh, Mayor Keegan uh, that you, uh, uh, with your steady hand, which has proved so uh, faithful and uh, firm over the years in the past, uh, to uh, fight for valuable issues such as uh, water and uh, the supplies that we need and so I therefore highly recommend uh, to the council that you lead the city and your people in the careful hands of Mayor uh, uh, O'Brien Keegan, uh, who uh, can do this better than anyone I know. This is a really challenging job because of the forces of the environmental groups throughout the state that are mustering their forces uh, uh, and give it for uh, causes that are not as important as the human uh, uh, need. Thank you again, Mayor O'Brien Keegan, for your service. 
uh, thank you to all of our council members, uh, to each one of you for your service. And do please contribute all that you can to fight to protect our water for Burlingame, in Burlingame, and for our citizens. And, and uh, I appreciate again the opportunity of serving you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Good night. Thank you very much, Ms. O'Mahony. It will be a privilege to serve on uh, BOSQUA on behalf of the city of Burlingame. I would like to extend uh, to my colleagues uh, if anyone would like to make any comments. Yes, Council Member Colson. Okay, we have Council Member Colson. Thank you. Um, I would just like to thank former Mayor O'Mahony for her steady hand in this effort. I see her work every day when I'm on the CCAG committee working on um, water and infrastructure. I can see her um, fingerprints all over the work that's being done there and know how much I appreciate it. Um, she has been a um, stalwart leader and with focus on infrastructure, um, water, sewer, all the important things that are the core of the business that we do here in Burlingame. And this work that she has done over the last number of years to secure the water that we need to increase our housing and continue our business growth has been critical. So thank you very much, uh, Mayor, and I appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Colson. I may have uh, Council Member Beach. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And again, I just want to reiterate our appreciation for your service on Bosca, uh, Mayor O'Mahony. I, you know, I never had the privilege to serve with you, but followed your work here in Burlingame beforehand, before I was elected to council, and just really admire not only your work on, on Bosca, but certainly in the infrastructure world. And make no mistake, we would not have the new Broadway overpass if it not had been for your efforts and advocacy at the Transportation Authority. You are a legend among staff and electeds there. It's an honor to serve um, in that seat as well right now at the Transportation Authority. Not only the bike ped overpass, which is in your name and so, so appropriately honored for you, but for that overpass in general, for all the infrastructure work, not only you advocated for here in Burlingame, but also throughout the county and the region. So thank you so much for your, your commendable and incredible service over the years. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Beach. Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I just want to add my thanks for your many, many, many years of service to the city of Burlingame. And on a personal note, I'd like to give you my thanks for a wonderful calculus class at College of <laughs> San Mateo, where you were my teacher. So thank you. Uh, and thanks, you know, great, everything you did for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Keep up the good work. Council Member Brownrigg. Mayor Mahoney, you are a model of civic and public service that we all aspire to. Thank you for everything you've done for the city. Thank you, uh, Mayor Brownrigg. Again, thank you, uh, Mayor Rosalie O'Mahoney. Uh, again, um, congratulations to you for all your years of dedication to the city of, of Burlingame. You dedicated your life uh, to the city of Burlingame, we were um, kind of laid a foundation for us, and uh, we hope to continue with the good work that you have started uh, many years ago. Thank you, Mayor uh, O'Brien Kigman, uh, and uh, you are going to have a big job ahead of you, but I am absolutely confident that you will take care of all of our people in Burlingame. Thank you again. Thank you again. Uh, yeah. before, before we conclude, I, I want to call on um, Director Syed Matuza. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, Mayor O'Brien Keegan, uh, I would like to just say that uh, it has been a uh, great pleasure to work with Rosalie all over the, over the years. Uh, I have uh, uh, known her uh, just uh, from uh, not just as a council member, mayor, but also as a colleague working uh, side by side on many, many projects and as a good friend, um, I, um, there's just, a, I cannot express in words how, um, how much I appreciated uh, her counsel, uh, her support for uh, projects that we received uh, funding uh, tens and tens of millions of dollars over the last 20 some years. So. Again, thank you, Leslie, for, for, uh, for serving on BOSCA, serving on CCAC, serving on all these 
regional transportation committees and, uh, and uh, being part of the um, 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 support to public works in particular and, uh, and, uh, and the city as, as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Syed. We are appreciating the ground we walk on because of you and your team who take care of our land and our utilities, our sewers and all that so carefully. God bless all of you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna open this up to the public. Um, I do have Nicole Sankula, who is the Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of BOSQUA and I'll let her say a few words. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Yeah, good evening, Mayor Keegan and members of the council. And most importantly, good evening, Rosalie. I am really pleased to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Nicole Senkula. I am the Chief Executive Officer for Bosca. Um, I'm speaking tonight to express my sincere gratitude uh, and appreciation to Rosalie O'Mahony for her decades of exemplary public service. Rosalie is if you didn't know it, one of Bosca's original founding board members. As a council member for Burlingame, actually in 2002, Rosalie was part of the group, um, we like to call them a, the, fiery little cabal, the fiery cabal of local elected officials that went to Sacramento to secure the right for this region to form Bosca, a water agency that represents the 1.8 million residents and over 40,000 businesses in Alameda, San Mateo and Santa Clara counties that rely upon the Hetch Hetchy regional water system. And of course, this includes the residents and businesses in the city of Burlingame. And for over 18 years, as a member of the Bosca board, Rosalie has worked tirelessly for these water customers to ensure a reliable supply of high quality water at a fair price. And while Bosca's work is not done, the organization that Rosalie helped to establish will continue this vitally important work for the water customers. Personally, I also want to thank Rosalie for the mentorship and support she has provided to me. As a young woman growing up in Burlingame, Rosalie was the first female elected official I met. That experience with Rosalie helped me think differently about my future and the possibilities for my life and career. Later, as a board member, Rosalie challenged me to do more and be my best. And she also supported me as I challenged myself, most importantly, in taking on this role as CEO. I am a better person personally and professionally for all the lessons that Rosalie has taught me that continue with me today. So thank you, Rosalie, for your service to the water users that Bosca represents. And thank you for your wonderful example to everyone of what public service really is. Thank you, Nicole. You're very thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, I will call on Martin Kwan. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, hi everyone. Um, this is Martin Kwan, Senior Civil Engineer, Public Works Engineer, and I had the honor of working with Rosalie in the Storm Drain Committee. Um, she has been instrumental. She has provided historical information that's invaluable for me as I've been with the City of Burlingame for five years and with her knowledge of Burlingame for the 20 plus years, it's been great to have her on the committee and I just wish her well and, and um, appreciate all the uh, support that she has provided staff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Is there anyone else that would like to speak before I close public comment? Very well, I will close public comment. Thank you again, Mayor Rosalie O'Mahony. Thank you, Mayor Keegan and uh, Vice Mayor uh, Ortiz, uh, Councilwoman uh, Doon, and uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Beach. Co Councilwoman Cole and Councilwoman Beach. Very good. And thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to the next item on our um, agenda. And that will be a presentation by the San Mateo County Leadership Council. And I think, are we going to have Margie Power? We have Margie and Karen Megan, if you could promote them to panelists. Is Megan frozen? Can you promote Margie and Karen, Megan? Maybe I'm frozen. Sorry, what's the oh, second? There's Margie. Yeah. What's the second name, Lisa? 
Karin, K-A-R-I-N, Hardy. And we have one more guest, Brian Nider, with us oh. this evening. Okay. I got Brian. And then Megan, is Margie able to share her screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. You're on, Margie. Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Mayor O'Brien Keegren and city council members, thank you so much for hosting us this evening. I am co-president of Leadership Council, San Mateo County, and Karen Hardy is my other co-president. And Brian Nider serves on our founding board of directors, as does a few people on the panelist list here. So we have a slide deck we'd like to share with you to introduce our new organization. And we will go quickly um, so that we'll allow a little bit of time for questions. I'll just pull up everything right here. Are you able to see my screen? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Starting my timer. <laughs> okay. Leadership Council San Mateo County is a new nonprofit organization that is serving the entire county with all 20 communities. And we are a new organization that is dedicated to community leadership development. Uh, we are developing a flagship program starting in the fall that's based on a nationwide model where uh, people from all three sectors come together to learn about their communities and learn how they can make an impact. Uh, that's the public sector, private sector, and government sector. We put a few logos here of other organizations around the country. And we belong to a national network of leadership programs where we're learning all kinds of best practices and um, basically leveraging a lot of work that's gone before. Our mission is to inspire, connect, and educate both established and emerging leaders from the three sectors to positively transform San Mateo County and find solutions to the biggest issues facing our communities. Um, we are we are so excited about the, our founding board of directors and our advisory council. Um, we're also really pleased to say that we have council member Beach and Brownrig and uh, city manager Lisa Goldman all on our founding board or our advisory council. And this founding board really just um, brings a ton of expertise to this organization. We have leaders from the government sector, the public, uh, the um, nonprofit sector, and the business sector all lending their skills and their time to ensure that we're able to meet our mission. And this is our advisory council as well. We've we really um, chosen people with skills that we needed to bring to this organization so that we could really capitalize on the resources. Um, and like I said, to achieve our mission. So the strengths um, of our new nonprofit are that we are solely focused on countywide leadership development. That's our core mission. We have a commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging from day one. This is very important. And our founding board is doing work right now to, to um, outline what that looks like as an organization, as a board, and with our programs. We have a diverse board and advisory council. And we will be focusing on essential skills training. Some people call them the soft skills, but these are the harder um, skills that, that leaders need to work on, how to, how to engender trust, how to um, provide stability and hope, et cetera. Some of the harder things that you can't just learn in one class. And we will have a bias towards action. We really want people to go through our programs, not just in a transactional way, but when they graduate, we want them to jump into some kind of um, task force or serve on a nonprofit board. And as they go through the programs, they'll be thinking about their personal action plan and what they want to do to contribute to the county. And ultimately our vision for the county is to strengthen the relationships across leaders of all sectors and also the communities we want to increase trust in our public institutions and across, again, across all three sectors. We want to diversify city and county leadership, empower people right now who want to make an impact and aren't quite sure where the on-ramp is to leadership in the county, and ultimately strengthen the way our communities work. Our county already is very collaborative and does an amazing job with so many things. We just wanna build on that work and bring these programs to the communities that currently don't have them. 
So for our initial offerings, um, there, are, there are things that are gonna be open to the entire community as a resource. And one of those things is the, our community events and programs. So we've already started doing that. We had our launch event last Friday where we brought in a, a New York Times bestselling author and thought leader on leadership. Um, and he was interviewed by a local, um, one of our local newscasters, Raj Mathai. Um, and we, we have these community programs, um, which we'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, but they're open to anyone. And we'll also be having trainings that are available to the community um, to really make sure that we are offering our services across, um, across the constituents in San Mateo County. And then we, Margie uh, referenced our leadership core program, which is going to be a flagship 10 month program, which will be competitive and application based. Our, our application should be up next week. And um, this will be that 10 month program with our established leaders in the county. Then we're also going to be, we are excited about a, an online community that we're creating. It's going to be a closed community with a, um, a really great platform that we're going to be using that allows leaders to come together, um, ask each other questions in a, um, in a, in a, a sort of a more closed forum where you can, um, you can feel confident that you're getting advice that you need, um, also can help you um, collect the resources you need um, to get to help solve some of your, some, some issues you may be facing. And then our Emerging Leaders Program, we're very excited about this piece. Um, in year two, we're gonna be piloting an Emerging Leaders Program to really be looking at those up and coming leaders in San Mateo County. And we feel like this is where we can have an enormous impact on the future leadership of San Mateo County. Um, and this Emerging Leaders uh, Program will be a pilot. Uh, but we'll really be looking for those people who um, maybe don't know, necessarily know the on-ramp and want to get involved or incredibly talented um, and we can help them develop their leadership skills and their knowledge to, to help them into leadership. So this is just a very high level um, look at what our five-year rollout would be. So the first year we have our pilot program for our emerging leaders. And that's that 10 month program. In year two, we'll have the second year of the, of the established leaders, and then we'll be piloting the emerging leaders program. And once we feel like we've got two really great curricula that we, um, we feel like works well and is well targeted, we would then like to roll that out within the, throughout the county. And um, we're not necessarily married to this, to this particular rollout, but we would like to seed programs regionally throughout the county so that we can um, continue to grow that base of leaders um, who are civically engaged um, and, uh, and able to, to, to really come together for um, issues in, in the county. So after people go through our program, they will have an increase in civic understanding, which means they'll be learning about the county history, critical issues and current assets of our community and considering implications for the future. They'll build relationships across the sectors and um, meet leaders from all over the county. They'll expand and enhance their collaborative leadership skills um, and their personal well awareness to build coalitions. And they'll increase their civic readiness if they're not already involved um, through an, a board or being on a commission, um, fostering their individual attitudes, knowledge and behavior and find their own pathway to civic engagement. As I mentioned, we just had our launch event on Friday and we had over 250 registrants, um, both in San Mateo County and from, um, uh, from across the, the, um, the country. And uh, we were able to to, it was a fundraiser for the um, San Mateo County, County Strong COVID Relief Fund, and we were able to raise about $8,500 for that through voluntary donations to the fund. We also have two upcoming um, leadership spotlights where we're going to be talking to leaders about uh, to share their experience and their insights. So we have um, the, uh, the supervisor, Carol Groom, as well as Mike Callagy, um, coming to talk about both leading through the pandemic and the recovery efforts, efforts that's coming up. And then we have a conversation with two of our big biotech companies located in San Mateo County, Genentech and Gilead. And those CEOs will also be talking about um, delivering uh, healthcare um, in the pandemic and healthcare equality. So we have um, one of the reasons that we are presenting to you today is to, to let you know about the new organization, but also to, um, to invite you to become a city sponsor. We have various levels of sponsorship, about 40, 45% of our funding comes from our city um, partnerships. 
And um, the support that we get also enables you to use the program as, as part of your leadership development within the within the city. So these are the various levels that you can um, that you can that you can sponsor um, the organization with, and they also give you guaranteed spots within the program um, within our flagship ten month program. So really quickly, we'll give you a snapshot of the leadership core program. Um, it's based on three layers of learning. The first, the bottom framework is leading self, leading teams and leading in the community with a layer of community knowledge, different topics, education, government, healthcare, et cetera. And then um, a layer of leadership core attributes. So we're currently working with a, a woman from Stanford to help us develop this curriculum. She has a background in leadership development and we're really excited about it. And then why, why apply this information is for people you may know in your network or people who are attending the meeting tonight. It's an opportunity for individuals to learn more about their community, step, step out of their sector, advance their personal purpose, facilitate a dialogue about addressing change. And for organizations, it's a, a chance to also get out of your professional silo, expand your network across um, the community and acquire resources that can help your organization with their business challenges. And it will be a 10 month program with a cohort of 30 to 40 people. It'll be a hybrid program. So both in person and virtual, we're really gonna leverage this new format with asynchronous learning, which we've all learned so much about. Tuition will be $1,500, our inaugural rate plus $100 application fee. And the application will be up next week. And that's is our overview. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margie and Karen. Uh, do we have questions from our uh, my colleagues? Uh, Council Member Colson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this um, information and, and learning about the work you're doing. It's just great. I think it's always hard to cultivate and bring on new um, people who are civically minded and engaged. And so this is a wonderful way to cast that net broader. Um, the question I have is, I know most of your work is done on Fridays and a lot of it is during the whole day, like once a month on a Friday. So I would have loved to attended this throughout my career. And I was asked on numerous occasions over the years by Jerry Hill and everybody else to attend. The problem is I had a full-time job, my schedule was unpredictable and I couldn't always guarantee to be off on Fridays. So what are you, what are you guys going to offer? Or are you going to, you know, as more and more people are working two income families um, and I know if your company sponsors you or maybe your government sponsors you, but if you're just an individual who wants to learn more and your company's not sponsoring you, how can you participate if you can't take one Friday a month off? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and thank you. We've been we've been thinking a lot about that. Um, we are looking at different models right now. One of the things that we do to help plan for that is because it's one um, Friday a month, we publish those dates well in advance during the application process so that people can plan accordingly. We do know it's an incredible amount of time to dedicate to the program. As Margie said, we are shortening the day. Um, we used, you know, Traditionally, the day was sort of a nine hour day. We're shortening it a bit to accommodate people's schedules as well as really taking advantage you know, I think a year ago, we were all sort of wondering um, how on earth we were going to transition to virtual world. And now we're trying to figure out how we deliver some of the virtual world benefits to the real world when we when we all go back to normal. So we are going to be really taking advantage of that asynchronous learning. Um, but we, we've also done a lot of um, questionnaires and asking people what is the best day. And we just can't, you know, really the consensus is there is no good day, but if we have to have one, it's Fridays. So um, we are trying to shorten the day and provide some asynchronous learning opportunities well, and then we oh sorry go ahead no no what what i'm getting to the point of is if you're really working to be inclusive and include diversity a lot of people um in those categories are grocery store clerks or people who work or people like me who have professional jobs but when my client says you have to be in new york on friday i had to be there so how can you set your framework up in such a way that it's inclusive to people who simply don't have a Friday. In other words, are you guys thinking at all about, you know, like 
um, online, maybe it's not the full certificate, but online pods or modules that could be done or more shortened and compressed, um, you know, topical type events on a Saturday morning or a Sunday, different times throughout that could basically be a gateway or a way for people to get introduced that is not as demanding, you know, if you're a grocery store clerk, if you're working in, um, you know, a lot of career, if you're a teacher, you can't just say, I'm not going to work on Fridays, you have to. So how, mm -hmm. how do you do that if you really want to be getting to diversity? Yeah, I think um, once we launch this particular program with the curriculum, there will be opportunities to figure out how we might be able to put it into modules and make it more accessible in different formats. And we will have this closed online community where we'll be delivering a lot of the online content. So there, there's lots of potential. I think once we come up with what exactly we want to teach and get the speakers and think um, through the different resources we want to provide, but I think that would definitely be the next step is to then go to the next layer of making it more accessible. Because I know a lot of storefront retailer business owners have never been able to really participate if they don't have um, enough staff to leave their, yeah. their business. So it's definitely a challenge and it's something that we, we'd love to explore and figure out how to serve those people. Um, and Brian, who's joined us this evening, is uh, chairing our curriculum task force. So um, he's helping us think through how best to deliver this as well and what we wanna, what we wanna provide in the training. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Margie. And you raise a great issue. I mean, it's been, it's obviously a, a challenge to find timing that accommodates everyone. Uh, schedules, whether it's weekend, night, or whatever. But I think, you know, if there's any silver lining to, you know, what we've been able to learn over COVID, uh, our organization is delivering 170 online classes every single week. So we think we have a lot of opportunity to maybe fill that void that you're talking about, council member. Uh, as we, you know, roll this out and evaluate the effectiveness of the program that uh, Margie and Karen are putting together. Council Member Brownrigg. I'll be brief. I chose to be an advisor because I actually, I think this initiative is so important for our region. I think San Mateo County as a whole is changing in really important ways and having a leadership group that does a broader cross-county uh, effort at connecting people is going to be incredibly valuable for our county as we really see the power of working together and not just each in our own individual city silo, which of course was really the history um, of the county. And so I just commend the founders. I, I really believe in the vision. Um, and I will say that, you know, the connections that I made and I agree with Councilwoman Colson. It was not an easy commitment for me to make, and I couldn't make every Friday, although I made most. Uh, but those connections were lifelong connections for me because we were together so much. Um, several of those people have gone on to become significant leaders here in the county, which have helped, which has helped me professionally. And um, I just am a big believer. So thank you guys very much for broadening and and deepening the scope of leadership in San Mateo County. I would like to thank uh, Margie uh, for your work uh, on this. I was fortunate to go through the leadership program a long time ago, 2005. With me. And <laughs> with you. That's and awesome. I appreciate the fact that you will um, be changing this somewhat and um, sounds like you're going to be flexible too with what you are going to offer. Um, I also really appreciate the fact of eventually opening it up to the whole county. Um, I uh, work for Supervisor Canapa and, you know, the issues that we um, deal with in District 5 are much different than, say, in District 1 or District 2 or whichever district it is um, in the county. So it, it will be a great opportunity to really... Um, introduce people to how the whole county works because as council member Brownrigg mentioned it they work differently but we still work quite collaboratively and so um thank you for for offering that i know it's not till is it 2022 i can't well, remember but it was on the slide for this first cohort we are hoping to attract participants from north county and we've met with um 
Supervisor Canapa, and we've been attending daily city Colma chamber town halls. So we would love to foster those connections. Perfect. That's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and just to echo a little bit what you were saying, I think um, really want to applaud Margie and Karen for, and I think the presentation did a great job of explaining what's different about this program, what's different about your vision. And um, you two are folks, uh, you two are doing a great job leading it. It's a, it's a hardworking, active, roll up your sleeves board. You've assembled a terrific team and um, it's an honor to be a part of it. So thank you for offering something really important and different um, training program for the community. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right, great. Uh, thank you again for the presentation. It was very insightful and look forward to all of us collaborating with you futuristically. That's great. Thank you very much for the time tonight. Thank, thank you, you so welcome. much. Thank Have you. a good evening. Thank, thank you, you too. Bye-bye. All right, we will go to our last presentation, uh, which is regarding the Parks and Rec after school programming. So um, I assume we will have Director Glomstad do this presentation, or is it I'm Nicole? Gonna, I'm going to start it. We're going to tag team it. So I'm going to start good. and end it, and she's going to get the whole middle part. Um, but she is also controlling the PowerPoint. So hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint on your screen. Yes. Um, so, you know, I think you're going to be amazed because every time I hear the data, I'm always amazed. We have been in um, a collaborative relationship with the Burlingame School District as early as 1942. So we've been working with them, offering programs for a really long time. Um, and this year has been a little different for us. So we thought it'd be good for you guys to have an update of what we traditionally do and what's happened this year and what we're hoping for in the future. Um, but I just on a very, um, Nicole will get into the nitty gritty. But we, um, in a traditional year, are operating on all the element elementary school sites as well as um, BIS Middle School. Nicole? All right, good evening, everyone. I'm gonna do double duty, as you just heard, trying to figure mm -hmm. out the screen and talk to you guys. So. Um, so the first thing we did, we have two programs that we offer at all seven elementary, or all six elementary schools and then at BIS. Pre-COVID, we would work, recreation staff would work closely with the PTA liaisons to develop customized programming uh, based on what the school wanted. Uh, we have recreation coordinators that did an excellent job outreaching um, to find the structure and the scheduling. And we worked with uh, collaborative, collaboratively, excuse me, with each of the PTAs and um, the liaisons from the schools to get classrooms appropriately. On a standard pre-COVID world, we would have about two classrooms at each school each day. Classes would vary one to two days a week. Mostly they were one day a week. Um, and then roughly at each school, they would get about eight classes per that uh, session. And then pre-COVID, the average enrollment was about 20 students per class. Um, so we were serving, as you'll see in a little bit, quite a few students. Each session was about 12 week, weeks long and we did offer three sessions throughout the school year. Um, clearly, as we'll get into in a second, COVID changed quite a bit of that, but traditionally that was the structure at each of the schools. For youth sports, uh, it was a little bit different. So we offered elementary sports and middle school sports. Obviously elementary sports was at all of the elementary schools and they would play um, collaborati collaboratively against each other um, in games. During pre-COVID life, uh, in the fall, we had volleyball, flag football, and then cross country also added, uh, was added for middle school. During the winter was basketball for both elementary and middle school. And then in spring was just middle school sports with track and field, badminton, golf, and boys volleyball. Uh, middle school played during the week and then elementary practiced during the week and played games on Saturday, Sunday. So seven days a week, we would have programs going um, on school campuses. Uh, one of our philosophies that um, we take a lot of pride in is that we do, unlike a lot of other cities or communities, um, everyone got to play. There was no cuts. Everyone got equal playing time. The only thing that really limited us was the amount of space and the coaches that were available. For elementary sports, uh, they were all volunteer coaches, and we did contract out for middle school sports uh, coaches. We also created a coaches policy following the philosophy of the National Alliance for Youth Sports. Uh, we did that about three years ago, and it's proven to uh, facilitate a lot of positive coaching, which we've seen um, grow our programs and the practices as well. We also on Sundays had a drop-in um, basketball at the BIS gym. Uh, they, it was a daily fee. It was run by volunteers. 
And on average, we would get, we as a city would get about $700 per fiscal year, um, roughly. Then we get into COVID. So as we know, um, all the schools shut down. So therefore we didn't have any gyms. We didn't have any classrooms. So we quickly as either fluid or pivot are the words of the year, right? So uh, the recreation really pivoted quickly. We started offering online classes originally in fall. So just to give you guys a heads up for, for fall 2019, uh, there was a participation rate of 849. In fall 2020, there were 49 students doing enrichment programs. So, I mean, just that, that was an incredible loss to us, but we, we did try to do it as much as we can. On the flip side, what really, what really uh, skyrocketed, I guess, for lack of a better word, is youth sports. So following all the COVID guidelines and following skill-based programming, we ended up combining. So as I mentioned, we previously had some elementary sports and some middle school sports. We kind of combined all of that and offered youth sports. So adhering to cohorts and whatever the guidelines were at that specific time over the past year. In fall, we were able to offer volleyball, flag foot, football, cross country and tennis. In winter, we did track and field. We started a new, a new group of ultimate Frisbee and tennis. Uh, and winter, we or in spring, we'll be doing basketball across, which is a new one, and badminton, um, which we're bringing back from previous. So we got together, all the coordinators got together and was able to determine what we could accomplish with youth sports. Um, we also started some new sports. We have a new recreation uh, a program coordinator named Tommy Cook, who started right in March of 2020, and he's created the Panther Sports Program and the Get Fit Boot Camp. So he's been personally um, training them, which has been great. In numbers in comparison to enrichment in fall of 19, we had 156 enrolled. In fall 2020, we had 165. So by combining these sports and you know, figuring out how we can do it, we were able to not keep, not just keep our amount of enrollment, but we were able to increase it, um, which has been great. So just looking at some of the some of the numbers, and I can make these available if um, if you have questions. We did see, you know, enrichment was went online in spring 2020. Elementary, we did have new sports added, middle school sports, elementary sports combined. So we do obviously see a decrease in 1920. That's um, because we, we weren't able to offer any spring sports, and we did have to give a lot of refunds and cancellations at the end of our winter sports. Our end of our winter sports ended. Um, in March. So the end of winter and then all of spring are not counted in 2020. So that is the decline in that. We also have a joint use agreement with the Burlingame School District. Um, enrichment sports, uh, sorry, enrichment gets, uh, has 15% of our revenue and sports uh, receives 10% of our revenue. So when we utilize their fields or their classrooms of all of our enrollment, we do, um, per the agreement, pay them 15 or 10%. And that started in 1718. So I did go back a little bit further just so you can kind of see what we did beforehand. And again, um, youth sports camps uh, are ones that utilize their fields. So whether they were using Franklin or Osberg, uh, which are the two school district fields, um, showing you the revenue that the district got on that. And again, 1920, um, again, it's spring was canceled and then a bit of, of winter as well. Due to COVID. The other part that we do uh, collaborate with the school district is the field scheduling. It's Franklin and Osberg. Um, 17, 18, uh, the agreement, as I'm sure most of you recall, did change to a 50,000 uh, 50, flat rate to the school district. Um, again, that is decreased in 1920, again, because we did cancel a bit of winter and then obviously spring um, was canceled due to COVID as well. Margaret. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I know you forget you, you meet yourself to be quiet. Um, so, you know, I, one of the things we do want to highlight again, and we're trying to get it out every chance we get is um, we have a revamped scholarship fund. We had a committee that was put together to help develop it and recommend it to the commission and it was approved. So in the past month, we have just started really pushing it out. Um, I think what's the, the benefit of how we do it now is you apply once a year and that's it. Before, every time you wanted to do a class, you had to apply for it. 
we've gotten rid of all that extraneous paperwork. Once you're approved, you're good for the year. You just call and you can sign up and it's 50% off the class, which also includes any um, supply fees or clothing um, that they used to have to pay in addition for. Um, and, you know, we were doing pretty good averaging about 44 families um, when we back in like 2015, we ended up with a high in 2019 of 51 families because we had made a concerted effort at that time to get it out there um, even more. Um, in 2020, we didn't have any. Um, so we're going with calendar years. Um, there was none given out. And then this year already in the month that we've been um, pushing it out, we've already um, received 18 applications and approved 17. So we are off to a great start. I think we are gonna definitely exceed where we um, ended in 2019. As far as what's happening in the spring, we aren't returning to the campuses for any enrichment programming this year. We're gonna finish off our year as we've been doing. Um, and then we are hopeful next year, depending on what happens on the campuses, we might have more of a combination program um, back on the school sites. What is um, opening up is um, the fields, um, and it will only be one field. It's Franklin, um, because they're going to have construction on the other field. It will be open on weekends, so our field scheduler is already um, busy trying to get um, the youth groups out there because they are struggling with field space, especially since Ray Park has not opened yet due to our grass being slow to take, but we're almost there yet, or almost there. Uh, and actually they are they are starting this past this next weekend so they are using franklin this past weekend this oh, week. so we're we're this next weekend yeah so yeah. i don't know if anybody has any questions about what we've been doing where we're trying to go what covid's done to us but we are both available to answer questions thank you nicole and thank you margaret for your presentation quite informative um does anyone have any questions there we go. Uh, Council Member Colson, followed by Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you. Um, I just had one quick question, Margaret, which is um, on that scholarship fund. Is, is that all the money that's coming in through the Park and Recreation Foundation? It, it's, it's city money, the Park and Rec Foundation, or is it different? No, it's, it's both and sometimes other donations. So. What was new this year, which um, is different than before, and I, I should have noted it, is what the foundation is funding um, additionally is the after school sports program. So it's a flat fee of $50 and whatever the difference is, is paid by the foundation in addition to their regular uh, contribution to the scholarship fund of $5,000. So they have a, a special fund um, that has, I want to say about what, $22,000, Council Member Colson, I think yeah. it's about where it is right now. So we have quite a bit and we're hoping to really push that. I think it will become more um, popular once we're back in our traditional sports room than we are right now, but it would still be eligible for that. Um, and then the city itself contributes annually $10,000. Um, I'm sure we, you remember back, I would want to say it was last fall when we came to you and just brought you up to speed on the impact of minimum wage for programming. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping to blow out, you know, because we didn't um, give out any money in 2020. We have extra money this year to fund it. So I think we'll be okay. And, you know, if we get so lucky and there is the need you'll be seeing us coming back to council asking for some more funds to make sure everybody gets to participate. Um, so it's, it's a combination. We do have people who just donate to it periodically. Um, and and I, I would also, I would, I would also add also um, not, not so much this year, but also the YAC, the Youth Advisory mm -hmm. Committee has also done fundraisers that have also gone directly to the scholarship fund. That's great. So I think we have the, the YAC is doing work, the city, the, uh, the foundation, I know it's doing a lot of work. I know we had a special designation from the Doug Friedman group this year as well, which has been, I believe almost 15 or $16,000, um, which is not- I think that's a 23. Oh, it's at that's, 23? It's wow. at 23, okay. 22, 23. 
So that's, that's been really, really helpful. And um, I just want to say how much I appreciate everybody working to make sure that every child that wants to play sports in Burlingame has an option to play sports. And um, I also want to call out, and I'm sure the mayor will agree with me on this, that um, we have had some really productive meetings with the school district. And I'm so pleased with how open the school board and the administration has been to get the word out and work with us and partner with us to get make sure these funds from the city get into the hands of the school children. And it's, it's kind of a, it's just been really refreshed and really new and just uh, a really good change of pace over there. And I wanna thank that uh, board and the uh, board of directors and that st and the, particularly the new superintendent has been mm -hmm. amazingly open and helpful. Yeah, in particular, I have to give a shout out to Marla Silversmith. She's the assistant superintendent of educational services. So when we were um, trying to figure out how we're gonna push it out there, she was very helpful and um, guided us and some of her staff's time to make sure it's getting out there. And I think that's why we've already received so many applications. Um, we also have um, our one of our supervisors, Claudia Vega, who is bilingual. And so she has been going to some of their um, sessions that the school puts on for their bilingual families. Um, and so she's been going and just being a resource also for them and getting the um, information out there. So I think we're off to a good start. Great. Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz. Uh, Mayor, my, uh, my question was more than answered, but I just want to say thank you uh, for all the hard work. Uh, many Ortiz kids were in all the enrichment and sports programs and they enjoyed it thoroughly. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Great, thank you very much, Nicole and Margaret. Thank you. you. Guys, you and your staff have done phenomenal work. We will let them know, we appreciate it, thank you. All right, so we are gonna go into um, public comment. And this is a time when the members of the public may I'm speak done. about any about any item uh, on not on the agenda. Members of the public wishing to suggest an item for a future council agenda may do so during this public comment period. The Ralph M. Brown Act prohibits the city council from acting on any matter that is not on the agenda. So I'm going to open it up to the public, and I have. Uh, a phone number, so I don't have a name attached to it. So it's 927-6844-3269. Would you like to speak? You'll need to unmute yourself. Say it's okay, not I think they changed their mind there. Uh, the hand went down. So let's go to Linda Colling, please. Oh, uh, 927 can now speak. Go ahead. No? Uh, I know you're unmuted, so I'm just not hearing anything. I raised my hand, but that wasn't my number. <laughs> if that well, helps. I, I'm just, okay, that, I'm just going by the number I see under attendee, so it's Ms. Lang. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Kagren and council members. How are you all? I hope you're fine tonight. Um, I just wanted to talk about the Peninsula Overpass Project. Uh, I'd like to urge you to plan more or consider more community uh, discussions to really expand uh, these discussions about the project and possibly consider a little bit more study about the impacts upon not only the Lion Hogue area, but the, um, the city of Burlingame. Um, I think that this is a very important subject uh, that it will certainly obviously impact the Lion Hogue area, but there could be peripheral effects upon the surrounding areas um, in our city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. Sandra. Can I have Linda Colling, please? You wanna unmute yourself?
Linda, you just have to unmute. Okay, can you no. hear me now? Yes. My God, I feel like it's old home week. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't presented in front of a, another <laughs> council in years. Anyway, um, Mayor Keegren, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, my name is Linda Kelling, a former mayor and council member of Foster City and a 46 year resident of Foster City. Recently, you all have probably received an email from um, Mike Griffiths, who is a council member from the city of Torrance. He is the founder of California Cities for Local Control. Um, I'm here as a volunteer representative of that organization. And as some of you may remember, I was very involved with Prop 22 to protect our local funds due to our cities. But since then, Sacramento has continued to do everything to usurp local control. And as you are aware, the state of California legislators are increasing their attempt to take all of our city's local zoning power away. I don't think I've ever witnessed uh, such a push to remove our local zoning power away from our cities. Um, you know, just a few years ago, um, our only concern was to be able to define our own local zoning control and be subject to RENA numbers instead of being um, uh, subject to RENA numbers and state bills. I know you receive a lot of emails, but please pay particular attention to this email from council member Mike Griffiths to protect Burlingame from losing its local zoning control. California cities for local control would like you to join many other cities in the state by number one, replying to the email as an individual council member and possibly number two, pass a resolution uh, stating your strong support for local zoning control. The state push causes our cities big and small, rich and poor to lose their identities and in particular, placing all our neighborhoods at risk. It should be how you want your city to grow, your decision as to the infrastructure and housing needs and not up to Sacramento. I will say that Burlingame is a special place for me since my first job out of college was as a supervisor of recreation in your city. Uh, I worked at Ray Park before I, or during my time in college and so forth, plus the fact my husband grew up there. But it's a beautiful community and it's unique and well situated on the peninsula. Um, it's an important piece that, uh, of the puzzle that we call San Mateo County. So I hope you want to protect your city because you love that unique city and its neighborhoods. And as the leaders of the community, you should control your destiny. One city can't do it alone, but many together will stop this push by Sacramento. So please consider getting on board with other cities. I know the city of, of Atherton has already uh, passed a resolution. Um, and I appreciate your time this evening um, to listen to me. And I have had the pleasure of listening to all your presentations. Um, I was a graduate of leadership in 2003. Um, Rosalie O'Mahony was a, a great uh, example to leadership when I first got on the council in, in Foster City. So this has been kind of old home week. And then listening to this after school program from the recreation department, I, I kind of felt at home. But I don't want to lose our local control, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you will jump on board and at least read the email from Mike Griffiths, and uh, I'll follow up with a, uh, uh, an email letter to all of you. But thank you for, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Linda. Appreciate it. Uh, we have Mike Denham. Good evening, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I wasn't going to comment in open public comments, uh, but the last speaker, I sort of feel compelled to. Uh, I know one of the items later is about uh, a public a comment made alleging that Burlingame is a NIMBY city. Uh, it is hard to imagine a way you could better cement such a reputation than by joining the California cities for local control. Um, I think we've seen over and over that uh, council members of the era from Ms. Kelling uh, have been responsible for a lot of the housing shortage that we have faced as a region. Uh, and I would strongly urge you to just press delete on whatever emails you receive uh, su suggesting you join such a group. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? We did get an email in as well, Mayor O'Brien. Okay, would you like to read that please? Thank you. Would it be possible to install speed tables slash bumps on the side streets near Broadway Avenue with high pedestrian activity? 
we live on Cappuccino Avenue and routinely see cars speeding way over the posted speed limit. I've seen the black rubber installed elsewhere. There are a lot of people and pets in harm's way. Exiting driveways can be interesting to say the least. Okay, are there any other emails? No, all right, very good. On that note, I will close the public comment. And we, we will go into our um, consent calendar. And we have two on the consent calendar, items 8A and 8B. Is there anyone that would like to pull either of those off? Okay, is there anyone from the public that would like to pull an item off? Okay, if not, can I entertain a motion, please? Motion to approve the consent calendar, Madam Mayor. Thank you. So motion by, uh, made by Council Member Brownrigg, seconded by Vice Mayor Ortiz. Uh, Megan, can we do this by roll call, please? Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Council Member Brownrigg? Yes. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Yes. Uh, Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Uh, motion passes 5-0. We uh, do have one item on the um, uh, public hearings. It is the adoption of a resolution to rename uh, a 400 foot section of the former airport boulevard adjacent to the new town hotel parcel, Burlingame Point and Anza Fisherman's Park Bay Trail Lane. Can we have the staff report, please. Hi, good evening. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, can everyone see that? Yes, Martin, thank yes. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor O'Brien, members of the council. Um, before you tonight is a second public hearing regarding the renaming of the 400 foot section of the former airport boulevard that was part of the public improvements for the Burlingame Point project at 300 Airport Boulevard. During the first public hearing on January 19th, uh, staff provided council suggestions for renaming the street section. After open discussion, council suggested Bay Trail Lane. In order to formally adopt the new street name and following the municipal code section 12.17.008 12 street name change procedure, over the past 30 days, a public notice was advertised in the daily journal. Staff posted the public notice at two locations along the street section. Staff mailed public notices, uh, notice letters to the property owners that front the street section and staff notified the postmaster. As of today, staff has not received any objections from the public to name the street section Bay Trail Lane. With council's approval, approval vote this evening, an adoption of resolution has been prepared to formally rename this section, this 400 foot section of the former airport boulevard to Bay Trail Lane and staff will work with maintenance crew to install the new street name and update our master address database. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do any of my colleagues have questions? No, we've discussed this before, so it's a, a review. Okay, if not, um, I will open it up to the public. Does anyone wanna make any public comments or have any questions? I haven't received any emails. Okay, very good. I will close the public comment and uh, we can have discussion or someone can go right into a motion. Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution uh, as described. Madam Mayor, I'll second. Uh, we have a motion made by Vice Mayor Ortiz and seconded by Council Member Beach. Uh, Megan, can we have a roll call please? Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Council Member Brownrigg? Yes. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes, motion passes 
Now we go on to item 10, staff reports and communications. We have four items under this title. We will start with the adoption of the resolution appointing our new city attorney. This is the fun one. So I will give you a brief staff report and I know uh, Mr. Gina is here with us tonight. Uh, so we're looking forward to having him possibly say a few words, uh, put him on the spot. Um, so you are uh, asked tonight to adopt a resolution providing for the future appointment of Michael Gina as our city attorney. He'll be starting with us on May 17th, and we have an employment agreement uh, attached to the resolution. So as you'll all recall, in November, Kathleen Kane resigned as our city attorney to accept the position of general counsel for the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. We may um, question her wisdom in that, but it was a great opportunity for her. So after her announcement of resignation, we hired a recruiter, uh, Ms. Bobby Peckham of the executive search firm Peckham and McKinney to manage our outreach and recruitment for a new permanent city attorney. And Bobby was the recruiter when we uh, hired Kathleen back in 2013. And she was also the recruiter when the council hired me in 2012. And so uh, we brought Ms. Peckham in. She worked with the city council to develop a profile of what you were looking for in a candidate. Um, and the meanwhile, the council appointed our assistant city attorney, Scott Spansell, to serve as our interim city attorney. And he has uh, had his hands full and done a great job for us in this interim time. And he'll continue serving until uh, Mr. Gina starts. So we had a nationwide recruitment. You had uh, 21 applications for the city attorney position. Ms. Peckham uh, conducted some screening interviews. She brought the candidate field down to eight. The city council reviewed the eight on February 4th uh, in closed session. You narrowed it down to the leading five candidates. And on February 5th, you interviewed uh, via closed session all of those five candidates. And then from that, you selected three candidates uh, to come back the very next day via Zoom and have uh, final interviews. Uh, the department head team and I also met with the three finalists. And we all happily were unanimous in, um, in our preference for Michael Gina. So I'll tell you a little bit about him. He is a graduate of the University of San Francisco School of Law. He has extensive municipal experience, including a number of years with the city of Emeryville. The last um, six or so, five and a half years, he's been the city attorney for Emeryville. Uh, he also served as the assistant city attorney, he was deputy city attorney. He uh, once upon a time worked for a private law firm providing some city attorney services for Emeryville. So um, he uh, had a great commitment there and was ready for um, joining us as our city attorney and is bringing just a wealth of experience. We're really fortunate that we were able to get him. And so his employment agreement is attached for your consideration and approval as well as a resolution. His starting salary is 232,000. We have funds budgeted in the city attorney's office for this purpose, so we do not require any additional funding. And with that, I am um, so pleased to have been able to give this report to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you to our city manager. Um, do any of my colleagues have any questions? Okay, if not, uh, I am going to open up the public comment and actually ask Mr. Gina to um, say a few words if you'd like to. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. It's good to see you again, uh, as well as staff. Um, I, am, uh, I would really like to express uh, my gratitude uh, to, the city, to the City Council uh, for um, uh, considering me as their uh, city attorney. Um, it really is an honor and a privilege uh, to be given this opportunity uh, to serve the city council, the staff, and uh, the Burlingame community. Um, I am uh, very excited uh, to join the team. Um, everybody I've met uh, at the city has been more than welcoming. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very motivated and uh, very excited uh, to, to start in that role and uh, to give Scott a, a little bit of a break. Um, 
Uh, and uh, I, I really am honored by the trust that um, the council is putting uh, in me in, in selecting me as their uh, city attorney. And I will uh, do my best every single day uh, to, earn, uh, to earn that trust um, and provide you the best legal uh, advice and support that I can possibly give. Uh, so thank you again for this opportunity. You are quite welcome, Mr. Gina. Um, welcome to our team. And I'm sure we are all looking forward to uh, working with you. Uh, we know we are gonna keep you quite busy. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to it, thank you. Very good. Um, before I call on my colleagues, I uh, just wanna see if there's anyone else in the public. There is, we got an email in. Okay, very good. Um, and it's from our former city attorney, Kathleen King. He says, I want to express my congratulations to the council for their excellent choice of city attorney. Burling Game will be in very capable hands with Mr. Gina, and I wish him all success and happiness in his new role. Very good. Thank you, Megan, for that. All right, back to my colleagues. I'll close public comment. And would anyone like to say a few words? Okay, I have Council Member um, Brownrick, followed by Council Member Colson. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll be brief because hopefully we have many years um, to sing one another's praises. But uh, I did want to say that Mr. Gina was incredibly impressive in, um, in his accomplishments, professional accomplishments to date, uh, the way he handled um, a lot of different hard questions that Council put to him. Um, the interactions with staff, clearly a team player. And I think what has become so clear to me, and, and we were blessed with Kathleen Kane's service for many years, is how important a really top-notch legal team is for a city these days. There are so many different issues that come at us. There are so many issues that are important to our residents. There are corporations that want things that they shouldn't have. There are corporations who want things that they should have and we wanna get it done quickly. Sorting that out is, is really a challenge. And, and Mr. Gina's record um, in Emeryville you know, speaks for itself. Um, so I'm just, I can't wait to get started. I'm so happy Mr. Gina's accepted. And I would say that um, the compensation when, when we look at the entirety of legal bills is very reasonable, but it doesn't include the intangible that we gave Mr. Gina, and that was we removed a bridge from his commute. So you're welcome. Council Member Colson. Um, thank you. I just want to welcome Mr. Gina to our, um, our team here. I think it's a team that's highly effective and very collegial, and I'm delighted to have you as a part of it. I also want to take a moment to thank Interim City Attorney um, Scott Spansale for stepping up from November until now during a very hard time with a lot of difficult work, big DDAs and negotiations on all kinds of things, and filling rather large shoes that were left by Kathleen Kane and doing it in a an incredibly professional um, way. So, and then also just um, the idea of the two of you as a team is, is just really exciting for me because I think you both um, bring really unique and special skills. And I, I'm just so excited and looking forward to having you both. So thank you to the interim city attorney Spansale and to new city attorney Gina, we welcome you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor and um, Mr. Nina. Welcome. Uh, we're really pleased to have you. And I really appreciate the uh, our city manager going through the explaining the process we went through uh, because it, 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 this was not an easy process. We spent a lot of time reviewing all the information and talking to the applicants and clearly just rose to the top. And we're very, very pleased to have you. And uh, and again, I would like to also add my thanks to the interim city attorney, Mr. Spencer, for your hard work. Thank you very much. And to Kathleen Kane for her, for her uh, mem or memo endorsing our decision. So thank you. And welcome, Mr. Gina. Thank you. Councilmember Beach. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I echo everybody's thanks to Scott for doing just a great job holding the fort down. And Mr. Gino, welcome again. It was so clear in our interviews and your track record that you are just a dedicated public servant. That was so clear and you were a super fit for the city on so many levels and we're really lucky to have you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, so we look forward to our, your May 17th date. Uh, to thank start you, with the city of Burlington. And thank, thank you, you also to our um, to Scott for such a flawless transition as our interim uh, attorney. You've done a phenomenal job, and um, I think you and Mr. Gina will make a really good team uh, for the city of Burlingame. Thank you so much. We're so excited that Mr. Gina is joining us as well. Very good. All right, we'll move on to um, item 10. Actually, if I'm sorry, um, if we could have a vote yeah. on the motion. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, if we could have a motion and then a vote, that yeah. would be good. Yes, can we have a motion, move, please? Move to approve the adoption of the resolution appointing Michael Guinness city attorney and authorizing the mayor to execute an employment agreement with Mr. Guinness. And do second. we have a second? Second. We have a motion made by Vice Mayor Ortiz, seconded by Council Member Colson. Uh, Megan, can we have a roll call, please? Council Member Beach? Yes. Council Member Colson? Yes. Council Member Yes. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Yes. Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Uh, motion passes, 5-0. All right, Thank now- you, Mayor on to, Council. Very good. Now on to item 10B, and this is our housing element annual progress report on the implementation of the um, housing element of the general plan. And we have Director Gardner, who will be presenting the staff report. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor O'Brien and members of the council. And I'm going to hopefully share my screen. Let's see if this works. Does that work? Yes, that is working. Great, thank you. It, uh, it always looks odd on this end. So <laughs> uh, this is the uh, annual housing element, uh, annual progress report uh, and on the implementation of the housing element of the general plan. And um, I'll try to make this fun. It's <laughs> probably one of the less fun in terms of just these tables. So the, these tables are uh, what we fill out every year and every other city also fills these out every year. Um, it's way too small to see any of this, but what I wanna do is just convey uh, the format and, and what's really important here is that um, these tables just show one year of activity. So it's the calendar year 2020, and that's both entitlements as well as building permits issued. Um, now over the years, these tables have gotten bigger and um, inevitably then they, they get smaller on the piece of paper. It's harder to see everything, but to the credit of uh, the state's housing and community development department, HCD, we will call them, um, they have been trying to add more metrics and in particular adding entitlements as well as building permit issuances as um, the issuance of the building permits was really just kind of one piece of the whole housing production uh, picture. Now there may be some confusion because um, partly in response to the prior formats, um, the city has been preparing its own monthly summary tables, what we call the residential applications overview. And the main difference here is that um, what we do on the city basis is try to show the full pipeline irregardless of the year. So this table shows projects. If you look at the very top of the table or, or I'll read it because it's small type, but uh, the 1008 to 1028 Carolyn Avenue known as Summerhill, that was approved all the way back in 2015. Um, but it's still here because it's part of the production pipeline. And then as you go down the table, uh, there's, there's projects that are uh, approved through the years. And, and really the intent is to show the big picture of the housing um, production pipeline. The annual report just shows the, the sort of snapshot of one year at a time. So these are really complementary, but um, I can see where it could also be confusing because you see these different numbers. The table B in the state report is the one that tracks these regional housing needs allocation that we heard um, in, a, in a prior statement. And 
in terms of just counting our units towards what is uh, counted by the state for the housing, uh, regional housing needs allocation, those are building permits issued. So um, this is where we kind of go back to the narrow view and just look at um, what were the actual building permits issued. The state considers that once a building permit has been issued, it's likely the unit will be built um, and that's when it can count. Whereas um, an entitlement may or may not be built, usually it's built, but not always. So, so they really just count um, the units that have had issued building permits. So then going back to the year calendar year 2020, um, 287 new building permits were issued in 2020. And these are net um, units. So this is a net increase. We don't count uh, single family homes that have been uh, demolished and replaced by a new home. That's a net zero. So these are all net new units. Um, there were also 748 new, um, sorry, I, I copied the wrong line there. 748, uh, uh, or no, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting all confused with my own tables. 748 new units have been um, permitted in this current housing element cycle starting in 2015 up to 2020. The number we're reaching our target is 863. So we're doing pretty well. Um, we've reached, uh, we're at 86.6% um, and we still have two years to go in this current cycle. Now back to our residential applications overview table, you can see these uh, columns that show different shading. And what this shows is, is again, it's a pipeline. So there's the um, approval that's issued by the planning, uh, planning commission as well as the city council. Then there's a column for building permits submitted, uh, building permits issued and under construction. And what you can see, um, there's a few projects where you've got the bar all the way across where the project has had its building permits issued and under construction. But you can also see that we've got quite a pipeline of projects that have been approved, but have not yet had their building permits issued. And these are projects that we can count in future years, assuming they do move forward and, and have their building permits issued. There's a couple on here now that I know are just eminent and, and will most likely show up on next year's report. And then the second page of our monthly table also shows projects that are under review but have not yet been acted on. Um, one of them will be coming to the city council soon. Uh, there's a project on Ogden Drive. Um, and then there's a few others that are still in, in the works. Um, so those also conceivably could end up on our APR forms in future years. So in terms of highlights for 2020 and just the calendar year 2020, there was 818 units entitled, and that means it's basically approvals by the Planning Commission um, and City Council in some instances. Uh, of those, um, 287 building permits were issued. Um, of those, 145 were below market rate units, and, and that's really an achievement for Burlingame this year. That's largely um, a uh, to the credit of the Village of Burlingame project, which has really moved the needle on the city's um, ability to deliver below market rate units. Um, those are uh, affordable to moderate, low and very low income categories, which is something the city has never been able to do before. So that's really a achievement for this, this current year. And then also there was changes to state legislation to encourage accessory dwelling units or ADUs. Um, 71 applications were submitted in the calendar year 2020, which is about twice the year before. Um, of those 71, 53 were approved, 18 were still under review at the end of the year. Uh, by now, most likely those 18 have also been approved. Um, those are all approved ministerially, so um, they tend to go through if, if all the ducks are in a row and pieces are in place, those, those get approved uh, fairly quickly too. So that's the overview and um, I'm available for questions and comments. Thank you, Director Gardner. Um, I have a comment and a question. So my question is for the ADUs, what AMI does that fit under? Most of them, do you know? So for the ADUs, we count them as above moderate only because we don't know, we don't have a way of tracking what the rent level would be. Um, some cities do have programs where they will um, 
have some kind of agreement with the owner to um, have the rent capped at a certain amount and then they can count it towards their um, housing numbers as a more affordable unit. Um, we haven't done that um, and it's probably fairly hard to administer and monitor. So um, the at least the, the, the kind of conventional wisdom is that the ADUs are more in the naturally affordable category. The, the construction tends to be uh, much more straightforward than a larger project. Um, they they uh, get built relatively quickly. They tend to be you know, fairly quick, um, smaller units as well. So we hope that they um, do reach some of the lower categories, but we don't have that formalized. Okay, thank you. And then just to, to clarify, so in regards to units that were approved during this kind of arena cycle, there's been 1,676 approved. Um, and, but we, you know, we only count the building permits that have been given out. So that's really up to the builder and or, you know, developer to do that part. That's not the city council uh, or planning commission. We've done our part. Right. Um, so my follow-up question then would be what do you think is preventing the builders and or developers from obtaining their building permits it could be any number of things and and you know first i'll kind of back up for you know in terms of what cities are obligated in, in terms of of um, their regional housing needs assessment numbers um, cities are required to provide the zoning to accommodate the numbers they're not required to build the units um, and the idea is that if the zoning is available, the projects will come and then ultimately will get built, but the city can only control so much. Um, what the city can control is the zoning and the entitlements. Um, now, some of these projects, if you, you know, look at the 1008, 1028 Carolyn Avenue at the very top, that was approved back in 2015. Um, that site had existing uses with leases in place that had to run out. Um, and then it, it was really the applicant had different reasons for for taking as long as they did. Um, ground didn't break until several years after approval. So there may be other projects on that list as well. Um, I'm looking at one, um, one atrium court is another one kind of midway down there, which um, is probably very close to having its building permit submitted. Um, the most the city can do is is be available and try to um, make the process work well for submittals. Um, there's another one, 1095 Rollins Road is on there, and uh, we've been talking with um, that project was actually sold to a different developer, and you know that's something the city has no control over. But then we um, start working with the new developer and um, try to uh, make it really uh, try to be as helpful as possible to. Um, move into the building permit phase and, and ultimately get the building permits issued. Um, so that is the, you know, the city can only do so much, um, but that, that kind of tells the story in each project. Um, if it hasn't had a building permit issued, there's probably a different story for every project. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so it really looks like if we're at 80, I think what, 86.6% uh, meeting our arena numbers that by the time this cycle ends, I mean, it looks like we have a couple larger uh, units that will have their permits during this cycle. So more than likely, we're actually going to exceed those arena numbers. Would I be correct with that statement? I would expect so, because um, we do know one Adrian Court is on its way in. That's 265 units yeah. right there. Um, and then 1095 Rollins is another 150. And both of those projects are intending to submit. We're having active discussions with them and they are, um, they're putting all the pieces together to submit. So those two projects alone will, will push the city over the top of its, uh, its obligations. Um, and then the good news with, you know, this is a fairly lengthy uh, pipeline that shows multiple years of entitlements. Um, once this current cycle ends, anything um, anything that's still being, uh, building permits that are, are um, issued into the next cycle get counted in the next cycle. So a project may have been approved, let's say this year, and the building permit isn't issued until 2023, we get to count that project for the next cycle. Okay. 
And then my final question before I ask my colleagues if they have any is for the next RENA cycle, what is the number we're supposed to reach? I think it's a little over 3,000, right? The most recent number I have seen is 3,257. And that is significantly higher than our current 863. Um, Burlingame is not the only one in the boat. Everybody's numbers have gone up substantially. Um, where I would like to offer a little uh, assurance is that that 3257 number is right at about the same as what we planned for in our general plan. Um, now granted the general plan had a timeline up to 2040, but uh, the good news is we already have the land zoned to accommodate the units. We're not gonna have to do any rezonings if we don't want to. Um, we, we can already find a place for the 3257 units. Um, and not every city is in that position. So um, I think the, you know, the general plan that that will kind of pay dividends uh, years down the road in, in terms of just being able to meet these housing goals. Great, thank you. That's due to the hard work of both our, um, my colleagues and the city of Burlingame residents that have worked really hard on that general plan to make sure that uh, we can work toward those numbers. All right, um, is there anyone that would like to ask any questions of Director Gardner? Council Member Colson. Thank you very much, Director Gardner, for a good report. Um, so I, I just had a few questions um, with regard to the uh, tables, I think it's all table D, which are the program implementation statuses with regard to government code section 65583. And it lists out a whole bunch of programs and then how we're meeting those targets. And that was really helpful for me. Um, one thing I noticed under uh, two and three, which are focused on rehabilitation of units, um, it's not mentioned in here, and we may want to mention it, is Peninsula Clean Energy is offering many rehabilitation reach code um, options for uh, water heaters and electrification of EVs. Um, all, you know, all kinds of great incentives for um, re rehabilitation and they're doing excellent training of a new workforce to put all of that green infrastructure in place. And being part of PCE, we're supporting that financially and we're supporting it through our work in the city. So I was wondering if there was a place to mention that in there. I think we can mention that, um, yeah, exactly. And uh, next to those two items as these are programs that are available. Uh, to help us implement those programs. And, uh, and that's partly what this, uh, this staff report and communication is for this evening is to see are, are there things like that that we should be adding to the table. We have not submitted the table yet. So this is uh, very timely and helpful. Okay, great. So I would definitely add that in. Um, I had the same question on the ADU income level. I'm delighted to see that we have so many ADUs coming online. And the other thing I noticed is um, there's an O and an R, so I assume that if it's, there's an R, it's, a, it's supposedly going to be a rental unit as opposed to an owner-occupied. Is that correct? Uh, you know, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't think we're charting them by that, so I, I'm not sure what the O and the R. It just says tenure, renter, or owner unit type under housing development submittal. Oh, then, right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. That, so... Um, yeah, so for the projects that we do know would be rental, then we, we indicate those as rentals. That's great. So the vast majority of these are considered rentals. I only see one or two owner right. occupied. Right, okay. no, I get it. Yeah, the sorry. We, we call them all rentals because um, they're actually not allowed to be sold as individual units. So by Got default, it. They okay. Are Okay, that, right. that, that helps me. I was trying to understand if we knew those were going to be rentals or not. But yes, yes. the good news is when you look at the list, it seems to be all sorted throughout the whole city. So that's nice. They seem to be doing the job that we wanted them to do, which is it's kind of infilling all throughout the city, not in a concentration of any particular area. So that's, that's terrific to see. Um, 
I also noticed we have 100 Section 8 units in our town, so we track that data. Okay, yes. and we have a goal to add 20 more units if we can. I think I saw it, which is great. And um, I hope we can work with some of our community partners, um, whoever those may be, Hip Housing, Samaritan, or whoever we need to life moves to get those units um, included. They don't come through in our arena numbers, I know that, but it's it's just good to know that those are some you know, very low income units that are available to people. Um, I also wanted to understand, uh, so we have approved a hotel on the Bayfront that's part of when COVID hit, um, I think we came to the, the, the city council was asked if we would um, allow the conversion of this, temporary conversion of this hotel over to, um, for the for a homeless for a, a shelter for people who were out were did not have a home to, for whatever reason and whether it was COVID related or whatever so we do have I believe 81 rooms over there that are occupied by about 94 people and I have two questions on that one is um, it's obviously right now not permanent so it doesn't count in arena numbers but I did want to mention it because it is I, I'm very appreciative of our call my colleagues and our staff of working so hard and getting that done right out the gate and bringing all those people to Burlingame and be being supportive in that. And then two, um, as the project, um, I think, I don't know if it's the home key project and mayor O'Brien would know, um, but it's the one where they're going in and purchasing some of the hotels to make them more permanent. Is that on the table or has that been mentioned at all? for that particular property? And if not, what is the end game in that? Because I certainly don't want to see those people lose their homes. I am not familiar. I don't know if uh, if any of the other staff, um, I, I think if it were to become a permanent um, program, then that is something we can reflect in our annual report and whether or not they count as units. Um, they do that would still satisfy different housing program objectives that we have, uh, particularly for homeless um, sheltering. Um, I don't know the specifics of the, the you know, particular Bayfront um, example. Um, and and um, I, I know that the, uh, the county did buy some hotels, one in Redwood City and another on the coast, um, but I was not aware whether the Burlingame one was considered or not. I don't think that they are, um, the the Bayfront station is shutting down in mid-March uh -huh. and I don't know that the county is buying any additional hotels through Project Home Key because I think that, um, I think that funding is spoken for and that has kind of moved along. Yeah, so um, I, I just, uh, okay, great. So then the county will move, facilitate the movement of those people into more permanent housing, I Correct. suspect. Okay, great. Correct. That, Elsewhere that's in really, the county. That's really my main question is, you know, we jumped in early. I think we were available and made it work um, for almost a year now. And I just want to make sure those people will be taken care of. Um, thank you for answering that. And then um, this is kind of a combined question, Kevin, and it has to do with um, one of the items under here, HF8, is first time home buyer program. And I will say that I get a lot of questions about first time home buyer opportunities in Burlingame. But as I understand it, it's around $750,000, and I'm not 100% sure there's even really, unfortunately, even anything able to be purchased. And when I look at that, and then I look at the condominium conversion question, not to get answered here tonight, but I think we you know, may wanna explore ways that instead of letting affordable housing be sold and then taxes reassessed and then you know, rental rates increased, is there any ever gonna be any way for us to help people, um, you know, get into more affordable purchasing opportunities down the road here in Burlingame. 
So it's it's not an it's not really an answer. It's more or something I need a question on. It's just more of a, you know, maybe as we're thinking about these complex questions, it's a question we need to think about down the road, not just rentals but ownership opportunities. And I think that's all my questions, Kevin. Sorry, I had so many. Oh. Thank you, Council Member Colson. Anyone else? Council Member Brownwick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to um, appreciate Councilwoman Colson's comments. Um, I very much agree on preservation. Uh, and in fact, we're looking at heart um, in trying to create a new facility that would um, help us uh, obtain de facto or um, or deed restricted um, rental housing, affordable housing and maintain it as such. Um, it's complicated, but there are patterns. We looked at this as a council with the catalyst group, you know, whatever that was a year ago. Um, and so I think it's a really important point. And, and to that point, and this isn't exactly on the housing report per se, but I would like to suggest that we take put a hand to drafting a letter to ABAG and to our elected representatives in Sacramento that preservation of affordable housing ought to count towards RENA. Um, I really think we are doomed if we think we can create our way out of the affordable housing um, crisis because as much as we create, we'll lose even more when these older uh, buildings get bought by investors and brought to market. So I, I think we ought to find ways to incent cities to preserve. I think there should be financial incentives, but there certainly should be arena incentive to do it. So um, I just, you know, Councilwoman Colson's comments reminded me of this thought and I just wanted to share it with Director Gardner or City Manager Goldman or the mayor that perhaps we could come up with a letter that makes the case for preservation counting in arena. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Brownrigg. I've actually have said that for a few years now in regards to rehabilitation and working with, um, you know, small landlords that may have had their buildings for a long time and they need to do some maintenance and that we do some, you know, loans possibly to help them get the maintenance done and then in return, then offer affordable housing. And if they do that for a certain amount of years and that loan is forgiven. So it's hopefully something that we can continue to, to work on. Uh, anyone else? If not, I will go to uh, the public and see if we have any public comments. Okay, we have um, Mike Denham. Uh, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, just unmute. Good evening. You go. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, my overall impression of sort of the arena progress is actually it's not that bad relative to the number you're seeking to hit. Uh, but I think as you all know, those, those numbers have been historically been very deflated compared to actual housing need. Um, something that's being rectified in the next arena cycle. Um, a couple, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, Mayor O'Brien Keegren asked a really good question of why aren't entitled units translating to building permits. I'd also encourage you all to think uh, a little bit more upstream as well. Why isn't zoning translating to entitlements? So things like, for instance, the Howard mixed use area in downtown technically allows up to 40, 55 feet, um, could be a mix of retail and multifamily residential, but you still see a lot of those uh, properties around Safeway are one story older commercial buildings that aren't really a great use of space in such a prime location. Um, and I think things like that could really use some study of like, where are the places in the city we think really should become multifamily down more of downtown that is currently purely commercial is absolutely the right place. Uh, and I think you have the opportunity for a lot of units there um, that would also promote car light or car free lifestyles. If you lived where that, um, you know, some of those one story banks are, uh, you could walk to Safeway, it's literally across the street. Uh, might be about the same walk as if you had uh, parked your car there. Um, you could walk to the Caltrain with less than 10 minutes away. You could access all the amenities you need. Um, so strongly encourage you to look at that. 
Uh, I think it's also worth pointing out that we should not think about Renan numbers just in the total count of units. Um, even if it looks like, oh, we're 86% of the way there, the types of units matter a lot. And I know you know this, but I think a lot of cities get sloppy in how they talk about it. You know, they may hit their 100% by the end of the eight years and they'll say, we did it, we hit Rena, when in fact there are hundreds and hundreds of below market rate units that never got built. Um, and so I think that is worth pointing out and keeping in mind um, and looking for ways of how can you incentivize uh, even more below market rate construction. Um, one of the things that has been really powerful in other cities is an affordable housing overlay. So maybe downtown is you don't wanna go higher than 55 feet, but if it's a 100% affordable housing development, actually maybe we're willing to go higher or other parts of the city where you're willing to um, sort of change the rules a little bit for a purely affordable development. That's huge for affordable housing developers because then it's a, it's a much better deal for them than it would be for a for-profit developer. So strongly encourage you all to think more about how you can get these numbers up, especially as the goals get much, much more ambitious in the years to come. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I have no email. Uh, Megan, do you have any emails? Okay. All right, very good. I will close the public hearing. Um, this was just informational. We don't need to make any motion, correct? That's All correct. Right. And um, I did take notes for these various items. We can you know, make the change to uh, table D per council member Colson's suggestions and then um, we can follow up on some of these other discussion topics. Um, but for this item, we do not need a motion. Very good. Um, I do have a question, um, something to follow Mr. Dunham. Uh, when we do have um, affordable housing, there are density bonuses offered by the state, correct? So they That's can correct. build more units if, if you know, the financials are, are an issue, which it is an issue. The, the land is, is very expensive and that's probably one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of the low income. And I think that's where you the renovations may come in handy with those because those rents may be much more affordable than brand new units. Um, I would assume I'd be kind of correct with that assessment. So, you know, that's something I think hopefully we can look forward to working on. And then also, you know, is there any way to track those ADU rentals? Because there may be some that are low income that, you know, we're not aware of. Um, so that might be worth, you know, looking into what other cities are doing and seeing if there's any uh, thing, you know, we're, we're not doing that maybe other cities are successful with. So that's just a couple of things for, you know, food for thought moving forward. All right, um, back to my colleagues. Let's start out with um, Council Member Beach followed by Vice Mayor Ortiz. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Just wanna congratulate um, really our whole city for some really great progress, particularly this year. It's really great to see the, the numbers pointing in the right direction, progress being made on affordability. Appreciate the speaker's comments on the need for continued affordability. It, it is really important and it's sobering when you look at the staff report, it's a good reminder you can make well into six figures and be considered low income in this county. It's, it's, it's very sobering that a four person family can make 174,000 and be at medium. So um, we do need to make progress, but, but we are making really good progress and it's something to celebrate. And without staff's careful guidance and the advisory committee for Envision Burlingame and this council's hard work, um, those policy decisions done years ago have set the stage for moving in the right direction. And, and really to think that we, with all the noise about RENA numbers and new RENA numbers being issued, that we are in such a good position to continue making that progress, really hats off to staff for guiding us through this process and our community through this process um, and colleagues. So I think it's, it's something to celebrate. Thanks. Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I just want to kind of continue what the uh, council member Beach was saying. We do have a lot to celebrate. Uh, and as uh, I, I feel that our rezoning uh, has had uh, some projects that are in process now because of our rezoning. 
and I'm very proud of our project, the village of Burlingham, where we use the city lot to create affordable housing. I think we've done a lot of things uh, in the city to bring up these numbers, and it's not by mistake that we're getting that we're meeting them. And I appreciate staff's work on the report, and look forward to doing a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Coulson. Um, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make a comment with regard, um, those of you know, I am one of two council members that serves on the Housing and Community Development Committee here in San Mateo County. So I, see, I get the very fortunate position to see all of the um, Measure K funds, federal funds, state and local um, county funds and their partnership with cities throughout the whole, the whole county and where and how much housing is being built with these funds um and project like projects like ours i just remind people our our burlingame village does not did not use measure k funds or um we use tax credits instead so we don't always show up on their um dashboards and you have to always look a little closer there's a couple where they do take in part projects like ours but one thing i'm going to say is uh to councilman brownrigg's point where I'm seeing the very low, the sort of um, the very low income housing units getting built are either uh, city owned land that was maybe redevelopment land that was then given back to them that, and they have to, they're almost in these, in the, they're in the redevelopment um, targeted, very low income areas. Kevin, uh, Director Gardner understands um, how these work. And unfortunately Burlingame doesn't really qualify in that. So we don't have access to a lot of these very specific funds and a lot of the specific things that are being used to actually build units that can put a family making under $35,000 in. So they are getting built in the county and um, I'm really pleased about that. So that's, that is just one of the really difficult things that we have is land price and we don't have redevelopment agency land that's been housed that we can then pull out of our arsenal and, and use it. So it's really just our own land. And then we don't qualify for, frankly, for a lot of those funds. But I'm really proud of the work that we've done and the creative work we've done on the Burlingame Village. I know it's going slow. I'm looking forward to it getting open as I know everybody is. Um, but, you know, after we got through the um, situation with the uh, talk, there, there was a cleanup over there. We, I think, are moving that project forward again. And then the only other thing I'm going to make a comment about is, um, I know we've had a few comments earlier tonight about local control versus not local control. And I think this is just a perfect example of why local control is important. And the reason I'm going to say that is because we understood our city and where and how to rezone, how to rezone our downtown with our downtown specific plan, how to rezone the front of Rollins Road and then the north part of Rollins Road along the transit to the less expensive land that we had in our city in a way that made it affordable for economies of scale. Because the only way we're ever gonna meet these RENA numbers are for these very large, you know, 20 unit and above kind of projects. Otherwise you're just never gonna meet them you know, throughout our entire city. So um, to me, this is a perfect example of successful local control and why people who live here and understand land value and development can actually be successful at getting units built. Um, so with that, I will conclude my remarks. And uh, council members and, and uh, Mayor O'Brien, I stand corrected on the motion item. I uh, forgot my own staff report that it does mention that we need a motion on this item. Um, and I wanna thank uh, interim city attorney, Scott Stansale for, for reminding me of this. Um, so it is a motion to accept the report and submit it to the okay. uh, respective state agency. Very good, thank you for that clarification, Director Gardner. Um, so can I um, get a motion from someone to accept the 2020 Housing Element Annual Progress Report? Move, move, so moved. And do I have a second? Or either one, it doesn't matter. Second. 
or okay so Ortiz? the motion was made by um vice mayor ortiz and then uh seconded by council member um colson uh can we have roll call please council member beach yes council member colson yes council member brownrigg yes vice mayor ortiz yes mayor o'brien yes uh, motion passes to accept the um Housing Element Annual Progress Report, 5-0. All right, uh, item 10C, this is the discussion of interest in allowing uh, increased floor error ratios for life sciences and office uses on properties fronting old Bayshore Highway. Do we have a staff report? And I assume this is uh, Director Gardner again. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mayor O'Brien and, and members of the council. This is a, a discussion of the interest in uh, allowing the possibility of increased floor area ratios for life sciences and other office uses uh, on properties fronting Old Bay Shore Highway. Um, and just to jump right to the, the, the chase here is uh, the properties that we're looking at are what the zoning code already calls properties fronting Old Bay Shore Highway. That, that's a, a term that has been in use for quite some time. Um, and this concept is not new. Um, there's been a history of, of treating this strip of properties a little differently than either the zone across the street, which is known as Bayfront Commercial, um, and the zone behind in the purple, which um, had previously been known as Inner Bay Shore and is now known as Innovation Industrial. Um, and I, I think it's, it's kind of a transitional zone. So what has been allowed um, it's been considered still an extension of the industrial zone, but has also allowed hotels primarily, and then also um, some expanded other uses such as restaurants and, and retail. Um, but it's really the hotels that uh, was, was the, the sort of uh, particular use that differentiated those properties fronting Old Bay Shore um, from the rest of the Inner Bay Shore district behind it. Uh, a few months ago, the uh, staff was uh, approached by a number of different entities, actually three in total, inquiring about whether um, the feasibility of life science uses within this same strip of, of properties fronting Old Bay Shore Highway. Um, now life science and, and labs and offices are allowed, but up to a floor area ratio of 0 0.75. Um, and that's with the new general plan, and that was by design. Um, the intent has been uh, to have that floor area ratio of 0 0.75, um, basically everything you see in purple there on the screen would have that, uh, what's considered a relatively lower floor area ratio with the intent of preserving that area as industrial, um, given the proximity to the airport and the need to um, have a place for industrial uses and, and in fact the, the kind of ongoing productivity of that area as an industrial district, um, it was considered important to um, have, have that as, as the general floor area ratio for that area. Um, but the properties fronting Old Bay Shore Highway, they're already treated a little differently in that they can have hotels up to a floor area ratio of 3.0. Uh, so the question was, could a higher floor area ratio also be considered for, in particular, life science uses? That's really what, what's driving this current request, um, but it can also include um, more general research and development and office uses. So comparing what's across the street um, versus what's in the zone that we're looking at right now, um, as mentioned, currently office and research and development have allowed up to 0 0.75 floor area ratio for properties fronting Bayshore Highway. Um, hotels are allowed to be up to 3.0. Across the street in the red zone, um, kind of maroon red there, that's um, known as the Bayfront Commercial Zone. And that's the more traditional office and hotel zone. Um, it allows office and R&D up to 3.0 floor area ratio and hotels also up to 3.0. Um, so there's a bit of, do you mirror what's across the street? Do you do something that's kind of tapering down? Do you, you know, there, there's a lot of possibility. In terms of what is floor area ratio, it's such an abstract concept and and our general plan has this little figure as well as this definition in it, uh, just because it is, you know, what does it mean? So it's, it's generally, it's the ratio of the building area to the lot size. And what it doesn't do is really describe what the building looks like. That can be a function 
Um, certainly that's controlled by the zoning code in terms of height, uh, um, lot coverage, things like that. But even if you look at this diagram, uh, for example, the 1.0 FAR, it could either be a one-story building that takes up the entire site, you know, lot line to lot line, like something that we would see downtown, or maybe it's a building that takes up half of the site and it's two stories, third of the site, three stories, and, and so on. So um, it doesn't really tell us what the building looks like, but it does measure intensity of use. It's uh, the commercial version of density units per acre. In this case, it's um, the floor area ratio. Uh, one of the council members I spoke to today was asking, are there examples of you know, what are some projects? Having just said that <laughs> floor area ratio doesn't really show what it looks like, but what are some examples of, of and how do they measure up to the floor area ratio? Uh, the hotel that was approved at 1499 Old Way Shore Highway, which is within this area that we're looking at, has a floor area ratio. It's slightly less than 3.0. It's, it's very close, so it's, it's for all intents and purposes 3.0. Uh, what you can see, this is an 11-story building. Um, it's in an L shape, so it's got um, deliberately, it has its facade right up to the street with an intention to, to kind of create an urban presence. But then on the back, you can see it's uh, it's an L shape with, with some open space and swimming pools and, and parking and such. Burlingame Point, on the other hand, is a floor area ratio of 1.0. That may seem surprising. Those are taller buildings. They range in height from five to eight stories. Um, however, and you'll see the site plan, it's the same one we saw um, as, as we were renaming uh, Bay Trail Lane. Uh, the buildings have a lot of open area around them. Some of it's open space, some of it's surface parking. So although there's tower structures, they kind of sit within an open area and that includes the shorelines and everything. So 1.0 is, is this sort of office park density or intensity. A 2.0 or 3.0 is, is probably what's more of an urban and, and more reflective of the kind of development we're seeing now. A reminder is Burlingame Point was approved you know, nearly 10 years ago. So it's um, it's kind of a prototype of, of what was being built at the time and is now uh, getting finished, but um, we're seeing the newer projects coming in um, with, with higher floor area ratios. So what we're looking for, um, and, and I'll back up, I, I missed part of my presentation was that we um, first started this, you know, we received the inquiries from uh, the, the various um, parties that were interested in life sciences within this zone. Um, step one was to go to the Economic Development Subcommittee, which uh, consists of Vice Mayor Ortiz and Councilmember Brownray, uh, to get a sort of temperature check on what do we think? Is there some merit here? Is this something to look at further? Um, the subcommittee thought, yes, this is interesting. They weren't quite ready to uh, take a position on a floor area ratio, and, and there was some interest in uh, comparing the sort of financial impact or fiscal impact of a hotel versus a life science building. Um, in the past, the city has really prized its hotels for uh, transit occupancy taxes or TOT. Um, however, that's also highly volatile as we're as we're learning now. So uh, there's pros and cons, and we started with wanting to do a kind of side-by-side -side financial analysis. And as we got into it, we realized there's as many variables and questions as there are <laughs> um, things to plug into a model. So um, it's not as easy as just doing a side-by-side -side comparison. And, and in fact, you know, a property owner or developer may only be looking at one or the other. They may not necessarily be saying, I'm looking at a hotel versus an office. And um, it's really what is the market accepting at any one time. Um, Having said that, um, we're, we're at a place where what we wanted to do is get some direction from the council. First on, is this something with merit? Do we wanna uh, look at this as, as, a, as a possibility? Are there thoughts to what might be a proper floor area ratio to look at or, or one to consider? Um, where we would go next, um, depending on whatever happens in, in the discussion tonight, this is not there's no action taken in terms of a formal you know, code amendment or anything tonight. Um, but if we were to get direction, we can weave that into our ongoing zoning ordinance update, which um, we've already drafted chapters. We would be changing numbers <laughs> on a table that's already been laid out and 
um, there would be further opportunities to, to continue, continue discussing this as we look at that zoning code. Um, we can also provide other follow-up information um, should it be needed, either more fiscal analysis um, or more understanding of uh, floor area ratios or what have you. Um, but this is really a chance to um, get a sense from the council, is, is this something uh, to look into further? Um, and then the one last thing I will add here is uh, we do have uh, some of the interested parties are in attendance and are prepared to make public comments and, and they may, um, you're welcome, certainly it's the prerogative of the council and the mayor to um, ask questions as well. Um, they would have more to add to this discussion in terms of their kind of calculus um, than what I'm sharing here, but um, they're also available. So um, with that, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm available for questions of staff and then, um, from there at the council. Thank you, Director Gardner. Um, I, I need to backpedal a little bit. And, and this is a question actually I have to go to our interim city attorney. Um, we went to this item number and I did not notice until after the fact that there was a comment um, under the chat. And um, I wanted to make sure it was part of the public record for item 10B. And that is from Madeline. Madam Mayor, can you're I welcome. The, to... can, can, I just want to read it into the record so she knows that we're acknowledging this, this statement. Uh, protecting, I'm, I'm assuming SFH is single family home zoning at all costs, love to see it. So I just want to make sure that comment was part of the, the record and I, I didn't see it until I was on to the next item. All right, so back to item 10C. Do any of my colleagues have questions? Council Member Colson. Sorry, Sorry, I think Council Member Beach was first. Oops. If she had a question. Happy, happy to do it, or if you'd prefer the first question, um, um, no, I appreciate it. Mine that. is not really a question, but so maybe I can go first and, you, and then you can ask your question, which is really more, um, I just wanna make sure that we hear from our economic development team yeah. from um, Council Vice Mayor, um, Councilman Brownrigg and Vice Mayor Ortiz um, because I know they discussed it. And sometimes the nuances of the discussion don't always come through in the um, minutes. So um, that's all is just me asking if they're gonna comment. Very good. Thank you, council member Colson. I was gonna call on them to get their feedback because they've actually been studying this uh, to a much greater extent since they are on the economic development um, subcommittee. So. I know I did count, count see um, Council Member Beach. Um, do you want to hold on your question, or would you like to ask it now? No, sure. They can uh, if the members of the Economic Development Subcommittee want to speak first. That's that's fine. Maybe there'll be some questions that are answered in it, and then we Great. can go into questions. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Beach. Uh, so I will go then with um, Vice Mayor Ortiz, and then followed by Council Member Brownrigg. If you want to add anything. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We did have uh, quite a bit of discussion about this item uh, when we had the uh, Economic Development Subcommittee. Uh, it seems pretty straightforward that we should try to match what's already on the other side of the street, but uh, there was some comments about uh, allowing a higher FAR for hotels just to give them a little bit of an advantage. Uh, but one of the big complaints of the hoteliers about in that area is the lack of development and the fact that we have some empty um, sites that, that, that need a lot of TLC. Uh, and so this might spur a little bit uh, of development that would make it just improve the whole neighborhood and make the hotels a little more uh, attractive. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, we I felt that it was a good idea and we're willing to move forward with it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, Council Member Brownrigg, would you like to add anything before I go on to Council Member Beach? Uh, briefly, um, but I look forward to Councilwoman Beach's uh, question. Um, 
you know, I, we, the, we wanted to bring this to council as soon as possible because fundamentally this gets into sort of trade-offs. And the trade-off is, do we help landowners have a better chance of redeveloping their property, which then yields um, an uplift in property tax and uh, dynamism and the rest of it? Uh, or do we maintain the lower FAR for commercial development so as to incent hotels? Because hotels are such an important lifeblood uh, for the city, and that, that's a tough. Um, I think that's a tough decision. Um, you know, I would note that historically, councils back in the '70s stuck to their guns and insisted that hotels and just a few other uses were what were get, was going to go over there, and pushed back against low-rise, inexpensive warehouses. And we can see what happens when things get built. It's very hard to, you know, unbuild them or redevelop them. It takes years and years and years for somebody to decide to then redevelop. So it's a big deal. But I, I just wanted to share that for me on balance, I, I lean into saying yes to this because, um, you know, we all understand the travel, the impacts to the travel and leisure industry. And um, it feels like the right thing to do. Certainly the massing is something that I think we can accommodate over there. So um, we did want to have this conversation with, with colleagues because it really is a set of trade-offs. But on balance, I, I lean into saying yes. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Beach. Appreciate the Economic Development Subcommittee's work on this and, and you know thoughtful discussion that led to uh, bringing this to council so we could have a discussion about it. So um, I think, and I and Director Gardner, thank you for including some of the the pictures of the FAR examples from the from the general plan. I think that is really important because because as much as we know intellectually what FAR is, to see it and to think that you know Burlingame Point is an FAR one versus um, versus the new approved hotel on Bay Shore is a FAR3. That's, a, that's important to kind of put that into context as we have this conversation. So that was helpful. Um, you know, one of the things I know we're all concerned about having some kind of appropriate balance as we were in our general plan about jobs growth and housing and housing growth. And so, you know, there's always the concern about jobs housing balance. And I think I think it's important to bring out in this conversation some of the information that was in the staff report, but also in the economic development subcommittee notes. And just to confirm with Director Gardner that um, this, any proposal, if we made a change like this, wouldn't necessarily allow additional jobs coming in. It just repositions the parts of the puzzle where those jobs are located because it's really driven by the EIR of the general plan that, that has some limits there. Is that an accurate way to say it or can you articulate it better for me for, for purposes of the public who may be listening wondering what we're doing here or considering? Yeah, uh, that's correct. And in fact, that's important for, um, you know, the logistics of the environmental impact report that was done for the general plan. We don't really wanna crack that open and, you know, start over with that. Um, we looked at the, the numbers that are kind of in the, the background of that model and, Look, if you look at the Bayshore as a whole, and we're sort of just moving some numbers around um, on the scale of just these properties that are fronting Bayshore Highway, um, there's enough capacity in, in the assumptions that were put into the Bayfront as a whole district um, that there would be capacity uh, for additional life science uh, buildings in this zone that would still kind of keep to the assumptions that were in the EIR and that includes those job numbers. Um, now, if you compare, you know, the EIR did assume a certain number of hotels would be built, uh, presumably if, if some of those were replaced by life sciences. Um, those are different numbers of jobs and types of jobs. And I'm not gonna put one as saying one's better or worse than the other, but um, hotels tend to be rather um, job intensive and, and they, um, life science as a use, particularly compared to conventional office, has maybe a lower workforce density per square foot uh, because of the labs and such. Um, so, you know, that's, it's maybe a fairly complicated way of answering the question, but um, there, there's a lot of factors that go into the numbers of jobs. It's, it's I think, 
you know, looking at the scale of what we're looking at here, it's not uh, substantial differences in what was assumed in the general plan. Um, and that translates to the um, environmental assumptions that were done as well. Okay, and, and that, that's helpful context. I think it is fair to say though, it'll be different kind of jobs that are, as you said, created uh, more office-based, uh, different pay scale as a, and I think we do all value one of the very intentional things we did in the general plan, particularly as we upzone Rollins Road, where a lot of lower industrial is, was to preserve some industrial section of our city and, and make sure that we could keep that, as you, as you mentioned in the staff report, that's, that's, those are value jobs too, they're just different. I think it's probably also fair to say that there's different traffic patterns that would, I don't, they'd have to be studied and who knows what would actually come in, whether it's hotel or whether it's office or whether it's um, life sciences, but there's probably different types of traffic patterns depending on those uses. So that's something for us to consider as well. Um, I think my, my overall concern, um, well, I, I, a couple of things came to mind. We, we, we work very hard on our general plan. I'm always cautious about changing it. However, to um, refine it is not unreasonable if there's a reasonable need that doesn't throw the EIR out of whack, that, that makes sense. My concern would be making sure that whatever we allow along that frontage is, is a reasonable complement to that industrial area. And one thing that for maybe as this comes back is concerning like, should we not only just be talking about floor area ratios, but should we talking about, should we be considering height limits for some of those office or um, life science buildings? Maybe hotels, we wanna be a little bit more loose because they are um, a certain use that produces a, a, a certain type of revenue, certain types of jobs that have worked well for Burlingame in the past, but maybe for the office, we want to, uh, we might want to think about other limits. Maybe we want to think about in return for some of this FAR or, or height, could we have some, uh, if we're going to allow those larger office buildings, can we mandate or create incentives for childcare facilities out there? Those, were, those would be things that, that came to mind and I'm not sure how we incorporate them, but that would be something I'm aware of. I think we all do value those industrial uses and those jobs out there. My concern is, my interest is not so much worried about the short-term market needs because the market's gonna change over time, but what's the best thing for community planning? That's the lens that I think I really want to make sure we're looking at this to make sure that the um, the Bayfront has the elements and that is aesthetically pleasing the way it builds up and builds down and transitions into those different zones because it seems we don't want to have walls tall walls up against low industrial and then it it, it just creates um, a lack of coherence so um, I'm interested to hear what other colleagues are thinking um, before I kind of weigh in exa exactly, um, I'm, I'm just interested in the dialogue here, what everybody, what's on everybody's mind, thanks. If I could just uh, can we... to the point, sorry, Mayor. Mayor no, O'Brien. go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, one concept we've looked at, which uh, the council looked at just about a year ago, it was, I remember the night, it was the night before uh, the big shutdown for the pandemic, uh, we had a discussion about community benefits in the Bayfront. Um, and that was related to a proposal for a parking structure, which would be higher than what had been anticipated. And the thought was um, more density or more intensity or more height or what have you um, would be part of a bigger package, which would include a community benefit. Um, and that is a structure we've used in some of the newer zoning districts on the other side of the freeway. And, and I think have worked quite well. Uh, we may want to look at the menu of community benefits a little more now that we've, we've had a little track record on that, but something like childcare um, would be something that could be on a menu of community benefits. Uh, we've seen other things, land dedication, park dedication, habitat restoration. There, there's a lot of different options that uh, could be paired with a higher um, development intensity. And I'm sorry, Director Gardner, just a follow-up. It, it could be a, a menu of options is one thing, but really, um, either requiring it to an extent for certain that maybe that's something to explore too, or having a stronger than just a, one of the menu of choices, particularly for that need. I, and I don't know if that's the right answer, but worth exploring and having conversation. Thanks. 
Um, Council Member Colson, if we can just keep it for as uh, questions for right now, because I do want to be able to open this up to the public and um, get their feedback, and then we can go back into dialogue after I close the public comment. Thank you. So I just I have one quick question, um, which is Kevin or Director Gardner, with regard to these changes. Say, for example, then we were to make, and I, I'm talking maybe, you know the next time we do a general plan update or a specific plan for the Bayfront, there may be uses that we're not even anticipating right now, like um, agriculture, vertical agriculture, um, you know, which is a very green and amazing thing where you, you're growing your food, you know, one mile away from the store instead of 50 or a hundred. Um, so there's green ag, um, there's always the potential of housing on the Bayfront. You know, we've, we elected to put housing other places, but you know, I can't read the crystal ball 20 years, 10 years, five years, 50 years. Anything that we do now like this, would that prohibit any of these kinds of potential uses that we're not even really thinking about today? Not necessarily, and I'll, you know, kind of, add a little philosophical thing in that, you know, general plans are meant to be evolving. And, you know, Burlingame was kind of well known for having perhaps the oldest general plan on the peninsula you know, in <laughs> 1969 and got a lot of great mileage out of that plan, but I don't think we need to wait 50 more years to do the next update. And in fact, state law allows uh, general plans to be updated up to four times per year. Uh, now, maybe that's a little much, but um, the idea is that Things do evolve, you adopt a plan, you learn from it, you see what's working, what's not, um, and it can continue to evolve. When you get to a point where so much is changing, then that's when it is time to do a new plan, which is where I think we got with our prior plan. Um, but it's not to say, you know, if some new use comes about. And in fact, this is maybe an example of that. Life science has sort of emerged as, as a big use. And you know, a year from a year ago, we weren't really receiving these inquiries. Now we're getting quite a few, and you know that's the kind of thing that general plan can, can kind of um, to use the word pivot, which is everybody's favorite word these days. Uh, but to to kind of make those adjustments based on what's happening in the world, um, and, and that could include uses we hadn't thought of in the future. Thank you. Okay, before I open it up to public comment, I did have one question. Um, to Director Gardner, for life science usage, aren't the um, ceiling heights or plate heights much higher than normal commercial buildings? Can you talk they about are. that a little bit? And, and it may be that um, some of our, our public speakers may wanna reflect on that as well, um, but it does result in taller buildings, um, taller floor heights in order to have the mechanical equipment and, and the clearances we need for the lab. So um, a result would be possibly taller buildings, but again, you know, we go back to our little diagram. Um, the floor heights would certainly be taller, whether the buildings are, that kind of comes down to lot coverage and everything else that goes into that. Uh, but certainly uh, floor heights tend to be, the floor to ceiling heights are, are taller. Great, thank you. All right, I am gonna open it up to public comment. Um, first, I wanna ask our city clerk, are there any emails? No, I haven't received any. Okay, very good. Uh, so I will start with uh, Peter Bonsoff. If you can unmute yourself. There you go. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Meyer, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Um, my name is Peter Banzoff. I live in San Mateo County, and uh, I represent a joint venture of a group of developers that is looking to propose a project, a life science project in the Inner Bay Shore uh, neighborhood. And we've been in touch with uh, Mr. Gardner uh, and staff about our proposed project. And I've taken a few notes from uh, the council members tonight. Um, it was, it's kind of an exciting time that we're in. You know, life science has not had a uh, spotlight on it in recent years. It's been kind of focused on tech in the Bay Area. However, uh, the Bay Area has some of the best schools that represent uh, life science industries. And from those uh, academic research institutions, uh, you get the ability to create an eco space. And that eco space here is unique. Um, it only exists in certain elements in the United States. Uh, Boston is another key one. 
in the Bay Area is uh, frankly a quite large one that's you know, falling a little bit behind Boston. And so when we look at where these nodes can actually generate, um, the Bay Area has the best fundamentals uh, for new growth. And when you look at cities around the Bay Area that have the best fundamentals to support innovation clusters, Burlingame has those elements. And uh, you know, I wanna give credit to where credit's due. Um, the general plan is really, you know, making a beautiful city, not that it wasn't, but our family lives around here because it is a great place. Uh, it has good schools, it has great downtown. It has a uh, opportunity to be a fantastic uh, waterfront uh, innovation uh, center. And so as we look at what has happened in other jurisdictions around the Bay, we think that Burlingame has the ability to be this incredible uh, place, not only for STEM and other jobs, but a variety of jobs that would support a life sciences cluster. And so when we study these types of elements on a higher level and we start getting down into the details, we think that this uh, opportunity is really right here in front of us. And we support uh, the idea of greater density because the new lab buildings really need to be purpose built. They're very complicated structures. Uh, they are 15 foot height ceilings, it's kind of a minimum. Uh, they do have some HVAC needs because they have uh, research that's taking place. And the science that goes into it is important. Uh, it's important for human mankind um, and us as a you know, species. So we look at it as a great opportunity and we would support staff uh, in exploring a 2.0 FAR to 3.0 FAR. And the reason for that is because I think site logistics and uh, characteristics of each individual property are unique. And so you can't just take a one size fits all for each individual project. It kind of needs to be studied. And when we study it, uh, that type of density range is appropriate. It allows you to have a purpose-built building that creates a campus. The campus can then support amenities. And then those amenities can then support the greater public. And so we look at it very holistically and we you know, think that the city is taking a very wise approach to looking at digital density. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I have Jason Bass, please? Good evening. Hi. Um, Thank you, Mayor O'Brien. Thank you, uh, everyone else here uh, representing the city of Burlingame for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jason Bass and I am Director of Finance for EKN Development Group. Uh, we are actually the developers involved in the 1499 hotel project that you saw on the screen that Mr. Gardner presented. Um, we have gone down a very long road in working on the entitlements and developing what we think is a really terrific vision and plan for a hotel development on the site. Unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the recent pandemic uh, that has affected all of us has had a very severe impact on the hotel marketplace, um, has impacted both the demand in the marketplace, but are very, very importantly, as a developer, the ability to secure financing, cost-effective uh, and well-leveraged debt financing, as well as equity financing for projects. So while we continue to really uh, appreciate the opportunity to develop a hotel on the site. We feel that we create a very strong design. We've uh, you know, taken advantage of the economies of scale of a 3.0 FAR on, on the site for a hotel. We've been forced to, and I'm gonna use the word pivot <laughs> that was mentioned to uh, doing something different on the site uh, in the interest of actually moving forward with the development and being able to really mitigate for the high cost of land um, at that location and in the area. Um, we're looking at life sciences development as an alternative course for us that is very compelling, uh, obviously for the reasons that were just discussed in terms of the evolution of the marketplace, uh, the growth and demand for life science office, et cetera. But in order for us to really be effective in, in tackling that marketplace um, really requires an economies of scale that just really isn't uh, available under the current uh, regulations on FAR. We need to go bigger uh, in, in all truth to be able to achieve the kind of high design that we, you know, that we seek to provide that would be in keeping with the objectives of the city. From a development perspective, we need economies of scale in order to achieve sort of the financeability of, of a project on the site. Uh, Life Science Office is a very expensive and complicated construction endeavor. And therefore at the FAR that is allowed currently, it's nearly impossible, especially on a smaller site like we have and like a lot of the sites are, to create uh, you know, a, a quality development that, that is economically feasible, is financeable, 
and sustainable. So that, that's our reason for an interest in a three FAR. Um, the hotel still continues to be a strong interest of ours. We can say, let's just wait. The pandemic will get better. We all believe it will, we know it will. But however, the impacts on the hotel market have been severe. The, the, the return of debt financing looks like it's quite a bit of time off to get the kind of leverage we need to make this a feasible project. And the uncertainty of that puts us in a very difficult position with really what is a very expensive piece of land and a very expensive carry uh, to, to be able to sit tight and hold out till that occurs. And we see a very strong opportunity at life sciences and want to do a really high design development, you know, that is in keeping again with that skyline that you're seeking to achieve in we the city. Here, Brian. That was it. Good timing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I am gonna close the public comments and back to my uh, colleagues for discussion. Who would like to start? Uh, since I don't see, oh, okay. Uh, Council member Colson. I'll go, um, it's not an easy topic, um, you know, uh, looking at the revision of a down of a of a zoning plan but i think um that the comments regarding the hotel industry are very relevant and it could be years before those numbers come back for a variety of reasons i also think that if we want to continue the the trajectory of um appropriate and reasonable development on the bayfront that it would be worth looking into this. I also am really listening to what um, Vice Mayor Ortiz and Councilman Brownrigg discussed in their meetings. And given that they feel this is an, um, important enough to bring to this meeting and, and have a discussion about it, I would support moving the next step to learn more about what we need to do here. Thank you, Council Member um, Colson. I would actually agree with those comments. I, I think, you know, we have to look at um, diversity of jobs. And uh, we've been very successful uh, with our hotels, um, but the economics are changing a bit due to this pandemic. And it's going to be, unfortunately, a slow recovery for our hotels and tourism. And um, I, I do think we should look into branching out and looking at different types of, of fields uh, that may come to us. Uh, I'm not sure about where to fall in the FAR yet. Um, I do think that if we were going to go down this path and increase the FAR um, because we're allowing an additional use, we do have to think about amenities and how our community benefits from those amenities, uh, whether it's childcare, whether it's parks, whether it's you know increased open space. Um, I think we do need to think about that seriously. We have talked about the Bayfront for quite some time over the years and how it's underutilized. And here is an opportunity to look at a different path that we did not look at, you know, a few years back because, you know, life science wasn't prominent at that time. Um, I would be curious to learn a little bit more about how the life science works in South San Francisco. Uh, I know San Carlos uh, is doing some development around life science. So I think this is worth uh, maybe setting up a study session uh, to really learn more about uh, the life science industry, um, the amount of maybe jobs that it provides, um, the um, what needs to be considered to build uh, to accommodate uh, life science. Uh, I want to learn maybe what you know South San Francisco. Uh, what are the good points? What have been the drawbacks? What have they learned from it? Uh, same with, you know, San Carlos, what drove them to um, be accepting of the life science. Uh, I, I thank the economic development for bringing this to our attention. I definitely 
feel that we should move forward with this. The only question I have in my mind is, okay, what FIR are we going to, um, you know, accept? And it, it, you know, there, there's probably fluctuation with that. And I just can't make that decision when I really don't know the ins and outs of the FAR that's been utilized in other projects in other cities. Uh, so on that note, I will uh, call on council member Brownrigg and then follow it by vice mayor Ortiz. Well, Madam Mayor, I was going to, um, I was going to dive in deeper, but I think your notion of a study session is a good one. And um, if that's the consensus or majority view here, then I would save any more substantive remarks for a study session, because I agree with you, there, there are some data that would be useful to have and, and uh, to be a little more expansive in thinking about the public benefits. I agree with you as a general matter. If we're going to rezone something and create a, a significant uplift in value for landholders, and bearing in mind that there are commercial impact fees and other ways that you know, there are concessions made to the public benefit. Nevertheless, I think it's an important question about you know, what's in it for the public. Um, so I think your idea of a study session is a good one and I would support it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And I would, uh, I would support, I would agree with everything that uh, Council Member Brownrigg just said. The only thing I would like to add to the study session is maybe a discussion on safety of biological agents uh, for the community. I think that that's something we should touch on. But I do, I think that we should look at this and I think we should look at the community benefit that can be uh, added to as a condition. So I'm in favor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member Beach. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Also um, appreciate your suggestion for a study session, support that. The only other thing I'd add is that um, I don't know if it would be appropriate for the study session, but I just do look forward to, and I think we should all, we all look forward to learning more about the Bayshore Highway conceptual plan that we've talked about. It got a little bit tabled during COVID, but you know, the green infrastructure improvements that can help with not only beautification, but flooding and sea level rise mitigation and you know, the, the study of a potential road diet out there. All those things can help enhance that area on our Bayshore that will make it more attractive and a, and a better place to do business to, and, and to be. And so, you know, that's just something that's on the horizon as well that will make that a more, make it a more attractive area. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Okay. Um, so do I do, are my colleagues all in, in regards to setting up a study session? I certainly am, Madam Mayor. I would, I would suggest, though, that it doesn't need to be a terribly complicated session. Um, and so I would hope that we could do it sooner rather than later. There are a lot of people who are trying to make decisions. So, Well, I have actually another suggestion, and I might be in the minority with this, but we do have a combination planning city council um, meeting I think in April, I'm wondering if this is worth the, being the topic during that meeting. So we get a planning perspective also in addition to our perspectives. And it is scheduled already for April. Any feedback on that? Um, I, I would just ask, does the, is the timing of that, um... Is, is, it, does it, is this something that, Director Gardner, is this something that needs to be expeditiously managed or is this something that you could use four weeks or so to put data and information together and we could come up with a more definitive answer in conjunction with the Planning Commission and sort of consolidate that decision-making process? So that meeting is on April 24th and as we were as you were all discussing this, it, the thought occurred to me as well that that could be a good venue for this. Um, it allows us to loop in the planning commission and it gives us a little bit of time, uh, not a lot of time, but a little bit of time to put together some more information. Um, we may want to invite uh, some of the interested parties to make a presentation, which um, they had offered to do in this case, but we didn't want to get too far down the road on that. 
Um, so I think some of them may be able to answer some of these questions as well from, from their perspective. Um, and then meanwhile, we can see what we put together between now and then, but this does seem like it would be the kind of right, um, particularly as it, it certs into the zoning code update. Um, and it's something the planning team should be interested in and involves community benefits, you know, all these reasons it, it would seem like that's a good venue for this. So I like to hear from my colleagues, do would we have the majority uh, on board going forward with that idea? Yes, Madam Mayor, I think it's a great idea and I think this shouldn't be rushed and it's, that's a great opportunity to get the feedback. Thanks for suggesting it. All right, very good. Then we will um, have this as our topic uh, with our planning um, commissioners. And I do think it's a good idea to incorporate some presentations from people in the field uh, so we can get a better understanding of how all this works. All right, so if there's nothing uh, more to add, uh, let's move on to uh, item 10D, which is the approval of sending a letter to the San Mateo County API caucus regarding comments made at a regional API meeting. Uh, City Manager, do, do you want to start this off? Uh, sure, I can. I'm just pulling up the staff report on my okay. tiny little laptop. Give me one sec. Um, this item came up uh, at your last meeting during future agenda items. And there, uh, the San Mateo County API Caucus or um, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, I believe, uh, had a recent meeting. And uh, one of the panelists uh, during that meeting made a comment about uh, describing Burlingame as being one of the nimbiest cities in San Mateo County. And um, as a result, Mayor O'Brien Keegan recommended during future agenda items at your last meeting that the city council send a letter to uh, the members of the San Mateo API caucus to correct the record. Uh, she drafted that letter, uh, Director Gardner and I reviewed it, um, the statistics, and she had uh, done her homework and had all the appropriate statistics in there. And so the letter is um, attached to your packet for the council's review and um, authorization if you so choose to have her send that letter. And I think that is it for my presentation. Thank you, city manager. Um, I will call on my colleagues for any questions or comments, council member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I did, I did want to speak to this. We couldn't talk about it in detail when you suggested the future agenda item because it wasn't agendized, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, so I was the, the only member of the city council that was at the API caucus meeting that day. Um, and so I thought it'd be valuable to share some a perspective. I, I actually inquired with the API caucus leadership whether or not that meeting was recorded because I thought that would be a super valuable thing for colleagues to see um, and hear the context of that comment. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't recorded. Uh, I think it was, a, it was a great presentation, lots of good learning. It would have been worthwhile to listen to regardless uh, of the context of the comment. Um, you know, that said, putting myself in all of your shoes, um, if I heard without knowing context that the word NIMBY in Burlingame was used in the same sentence. I can understand where you're coming from, certainly the, the desire to defend Burlingame's land use policies. As we have seen tonight, if, if ever we've seen tonight, Burlingame has done some amazing work in land use related to housing. It's proven in our arena numbers and our effort and our commitment of staff and colleagues here on council. Of all the things we've done together, um, as a city team, as a council, it's one of the things I personally feel most proud of having been a part of that general plan update and the work we've done with housing. And I know all of you do too. Um, and, and it's a record we can be proud of. So in the last week or two, I had the opportunity to check my notes. You know how whenever I go to a meeting, I process information by writing a lot of notes. It's just what I do. It also gave me the opportunity to reach out um, and talked to the panelist who had, who had made the comment to seek under, just make sure that my recollection and memory served me correctly. Uh, talked to the panelists and a couple leaders of the API, API caucus that were actually in the room too. And I think this is just an opportunity for me as I see it to clear up a, a real misunderstanding. 
about what happened that night from my memory. I don't have, you know, a transcript, but what I can share with you is um, my, my recollection and my understanding and what I remember and what others who were there remembered the context. And it really was not about Burlingame's land use and housing policy. Really the comment was made in the context of district elections. That's what the API caucus on that Saturday morning for one hour, the panel was talking about district elections. And leading up to that comment, there was a discussion about how district elections provide the opportunity to diversify city councils. And other cities were mentioned, other candidates were mentioned in the context of 2020 election. Um, basically, the, the idea that the panelist, to my recollection and confirmed in talking, was talking about how um, district elections provide people of color an opportunity to win seats on city councils where they may not have had that opportunity before. Um, to be an outsider candidate coming in and have a chance to get elected. That, that was sort of the context. And then, yes, the comment was made that even Burlingame, one of the nimbiest cities in the county is going to district elections. And meaning that's giving people of color or people who have felt disenfranchised before for whatever reason, for being an outsider candidate, the opportunity to win a seat on city council. In other words, providing an opportunity for a candidate who's not an establishment candidate, not an incumbent, a person of color, perhaps a person that doesn't have the opportunity to raise a lot of money or have all the establishment political connections, the opportunity to throw their hat in the ring. And look what happened in these other cities where that actually did happen. When that comment was made early in the panel, early in the hour, I wrote it down, I circled it, Honestly, it made me uncomfortable and it made me sad. It, it made me sad that somebody who I respected on a panel who self-identifies as a member of the API caucus felt that way about our city. It was an opinion. It was an offhanded comment. In fact, another leader of the API caucus didn't even remember it being said. It wasn't something that was a big thing stating about Burlingame's housing policy is all wrong and they're a bunch of NIMBYs. It wasn't that at all. It was suggesting that our electorate is more comfortable, um, tends to elect establishment candidates. It was a matter of opinion. And it, to have been in the room on that panel, it would not have been appropriate to argue that opinion 55 minutes later in the five minutes at the end for people to make public comments. In my opinion, that comment does not merit a formal letter of response. If anything, it merits all of us sort of reflecting and listening and thinking about why that person of that particular group, not meaning the whole group feels like that, but that there are people that feel that way about our city or about our election process. And what can we do instead to start to, to, to be more inclusive and make people not feel that way? I, I think that's the appropriate response. And I think it's, I totally understand where you're coming from having not been there and I, I I really, it makes me sad to think about a person that would have called you up to share that comment out of context because I just don't feel like there's, um, I feel like that that's just stirring something up that really wasn't intended to criticize our land use policy. It may hurt our feelings a little bit, but it, it should be something we listen and learn from. And I think in the context of the bigger racial justice conversations that are happening right now. That was a huge theme of that API caucus panel. It wasn't a round table, it was a panel with three people serving their opinions and sharing their opinions with everybody about the election. Like one of the most important things we can do in those kind of conversations is just listen to people and hear them out and sit with the uncomfortable and figure out what we can do to be more inclusive. And it might even 
change our frame of reference about how we think about district elections because people feel this way, it's their opinion. So I wanted to offer that out there. Um, I really appreciate the effort you put into that draft of the letter. I, the, the content is something to celebrate. It's something we've all been proud to celebrate at different opportunities. Boy, when Councilmember Colson and I were seeking reelection in 2019, we talked a lot about our land use, a lot about those stats. We celebrated it, we defended it. And our, you know, the proof is in the arena numbers and what, what we reported tonight, um, it's working. But I, I do think it doesn't, I think this letter wouldn't be a, an appropriate response to what was said in the context. And I really did wanna share that very, very important context. In fact, I think the letter maybe we should be considering sending and I'm gonna bring it up at future agenda items is a letter in support standing shoulder to shoulder with the API caucus for the xenophobia that's out there right now and for the violence against the API community that is very real, that is very, that is happening right now. That is so unfair. That's the letter I really think we should send. I'm, I'm concerned how this letter may be received. And so I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity as I was the only one who was actually there to explain the context and um, what I feel the appropriate response is. Thank, thanks, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, I will actually respectfully disagree with you, Council Member Brownrigg, or sorry, Beach. Um, I actually talked with one of the leaders of the API because when I heard this, I wanted to talk to one of the leaders to confirm what was said. And I do understand it was about district elections, but a statement is a statement. And this is a panelist that is very well known amongst all 21 Peninsula cities and should have probably known better to say such a statement because it's not true. I'm elected to represent the residents of Burlingame. And to me hearing that statement, and it's not the first time I've heard this statement, is sad, like you said. I am not mixing this with district elections. That statement is false. And all I want to do is to correct the record, because as you know, and as all of us know, a statement goes a long way. Because if there was 25 people at that meeting, they can tell another 50 people and then another 100 people. And I don't want Burlingame to have the reputation of being the nimbiest city in the peninsula. And so I am doing this solely to correct the record because we as colleagues are elected to represent Burlingame. And to me, this is a slap in the face. And she represents our city to an extent. And it's a false statement. And to me, it is our job to defend our city and to defend our colleagues that have worked so hard to provide housing options to provide at all income levels the best we can to try to implement what the state wants us to do and provide housing options for everyone. And when a statement like that is said, it undermines all the work that we have done for the last few years. It undermines the work that council member uh, Colson and myself have done for Home for All. We were the pilot city for housing. We were the city that had the open meetings of, of really good groups of people that came in to talk about how are we going to move forward. So I don't want that to be ignored. And I'm solely doing this to correct the record. And I did talk to the API leader. I actually showed him the letter before I sent it to our city manager and director Gardner to make sure it was all factual. And he said it was fine to send to the API. I wanted to get his permission. So I don't think I'm overstepping any boundaries. Like I said, I am simply correcting the record. So those are my comments for right now. Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm, and I'm listening to both sides. I'm trying to be open-minded here, but um, when I hear the word NIMBY, 
when I hear the word NIMBY, the word NIMBY doesn't tell me that it's about inclusion. NIMBY tells me it's about building and about housing and about, uh, so, so when, when I hear the explanation that it's about the inclusion and the, uh, it, it just, even if that's what was meant, the words that were said were NIMBY and I, 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 I do take it personally and I, and I do because I, we have worked very hard to, to not be NIMBYist, to rezone, to, to build on city lots, to do all the things that we've done that are really, and it's, we've come a long way from the first, when I first was elected, we, the, the mentality was different, we've changed. And we've come a long way, and so I do. I do feel a little insulted when I hear that we're being called the NIMBYist city in the, in the county. I, and again, I don't. When I hear that, I don't hear inclusion. And it, but if we're going to address the inclusion part of it, I am the. Uh, here, here it is a Latino that's a, a elected to the city council. Again, I, I, I don't. I, I don't see that either, and and I think that we've come a long way. Um, so I, I, you know, I'm in favor of sending the letter, and um, and I, I, I do, I do take it personally. So, uh, with that, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to make any comment? Council Member Colson. Um, I wasn't there, and I, you know, I did talk to a few people that were there, got a little bit of information, but. As far as I'm concerned, this is just a fact-based letter that um, is, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not critical of anybody. It's not, you know, um, I mean, these meetings, you know how they go. Sometimes people say things like, we all say things we wish we hadn't said. But I do think, I do agree with the vice mayor that, um, is it perfect? No. Do we have a long way to go? Yes. But I think that this, these facts um, are worth sharing. And in fact, two of the people I spoke to were completely, they were part of the API caucus and they, they were completely unaware of all this good work that had happened. And I don't know how people aren't aware, but it, you, know, you get focused on your own city. So given the letter is fact-based, it's a clarification letter and it just um, helps support the actual work that has been done, I have no problem sending it either. Thank you, Council Member um, Colson. I do want to actually um, take the time to read this letter uh, for the public in case they don't know what this letter contains, because as I mentioned, it's purely factually based. Um, so here it is. Dear Mr. Lee and members of the API caucus, I am writing regarding comments made by a panel member at a regional API meeting in mid-February. We understand that this panel member singled out Burlingame as being one of the nimbiest cities in San Mateo County, implying that Burlingame residents and the city council were obstructing housing development. As a matter of fact, since 2015, the Burlingame council has approved every housing project that has come before us and the Planning Commission has approved more than 1,676 units of housing, which is more than double the 2015-2023 total regional housing needs assessment assigned by the state. Nearly 300 of these units are workforce or senior below market rate homes. In aggregate, the city will now have a total of over 14,000 homes. 8,076 of these homes will be multi-family residential and around 6,000 will be single family with an allowable accessory dwelling unit. Since January 2020, when the most recent state mandate became effective, the city has approved 63 ADU units. Burlingame has been an active participant in the county-led Home for All initiative and was the first city to volunteer for a pilot program to set the stage for community acceptance of 100% affordable housing project and a general plan update that projected 20% housing growth. We are proud that our city council unanimously adopted the general plan in January, 2019. Presently, there are another 700 units in the proposed and preliminary 
pipeline, including nearly 200 BMR homes. It is important to provide the facts around Burlingame and our work around housing production. The unfortunate narrative that Burlingame residents and council are not doing anything to build a welcoming and inclusive community is not fact-based. We are proud to say that with our newly adopted general plan, we have zoned for enough future housing to meet the production goals established in the upcoming 2030 RENA cycle. There aren't too many cities that have zoned for basically a whole new neighborhood in an industrial area of a city. The work around housing has been a priority for our residents, our staff, and city council, and we just appreciate the opportunity to correct the record. So on that note, I will open it up to the public and I will start with Seema Patel. Madam Paul. Mayor, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just before you start, for those who haven't yes. had a chance to speak at a public meeting before, um, are you going to be setting a time limit for the public speakers on this? Yes, I will keep the normal time limit that we've always kept, the three minutes. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so I will start with Seema Patel, followed by Mike Dunham, and then Madeline. Hello, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to comment. Um, my name is Seema, I'm a member of the API community. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, given the violence and racism that the Asian American community is experiencing right now, I don't think that this is a great time to be lodging a complaint to the API caucus about NIMBYism, especially when exclusionary zoning has historically disadvantaged minorities and people of color from living in our communities. I also think, um, sorry, the optics of this are not great as it doesn't appear there, to, there are any members of the API community among the council that is lodging this complaint. Um, as council member Beach said, I think it would be a much better use of time to discuss how Burlingame could be supporting members of the API community right now. And mayor, I know you said you don't wanna have a reputation as the nimbius city on the peninsula, but I'm worried that by su submitting this letter, you'll develop a reputation for being unsympathetic to the API community during a very difficult time. Thank you so much. Mike Dunham. Uh, good evening, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak yet again. Um, I'm 100% in agreement with Council Member Beach that you should not send this letter. Um, I understand that uh, you all don't think of yourselves as NIMBYs. And I think if you look at the top line numbers of your city, um, you would say, oh, we're not a NIMBY city. But there is history here. Um, as recently as 1970, at which point most Burlingame neighborhoods had been built, Burlingame was 99% white. And so the families, if you were Asian, if you were a person of color, you just very rarely could you live here. That has slowly changed over time. Um, but I think if you looked at patterns of segregation across the city, you would find that it is not a racially mixed place in every neighborhood. Uh, when you know, most of our single family home neighborhoods, some set, individual housing units sell for over $2 million. Uh, that by necessity will segregate those neighborhoods. So I think when you hear a member of the API community saying Burlingame is a NIMBY city, what they're really saying is uh, Burlingame is a city that is not willing to touch these neighborhoods of mostly white, mostly wealthy people. Uh, they will do anything but rezone those neighborhoods. That's what they're saying. The city may have found ways to, to zone for more housing in other places. That's the low hanging fruit. The cities that are really making progress on integration and housing are ones that are really pushing the envelope and rethinking everything. South City just voted to study uh, raising their baseline zoning. The city of Berkeley just committed 9-0 uh, to ending exclusionary zoning in their city. Uh, there are bills in the state legislature uh, with similar goals. This is what makes Burlingame and Nimby City and why people would perceive it that way. All that said, it is a horrible message you're sending to send this letter. What it basically says is if a person of color criticizes a wealthy uh, majority white city, you can expect a sternly worded 
very technocratic letter back criticizing uh, your factual errors. That is not how in this sort of new world of being more uh, racially conscious that white people should be treating their roles in our society. I, I think Council Member Beach is entirely right. Now is the time to uh, sit back and listen. Think about why people might say these things. Think about why they might feel this way. Offer your support, offer your allyship. Not go after these like technocratic things about uh, a factual error you think someone made or you don't think is fair or doesn't recognize all the good work you've done. It's a really bad look. I think if you publish this letter, you're going to get so much blowback. Uh, you will be having to come again and discuss this again and again. Just drop it. Let it be. Consider uh, how you can show your support to the API to community at a time uh, that is with a lot of them are really feeling hurt, really feeling threatened. Uh, that would be a much more positive way out of it. This Sending this letter, I think, would be a huge mistake. Uh, and I, I strongly urge you not to do so. Thank you. May we have Madeline, please? Uh, good evening, council members and Madam Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I agree with Council Member Beach to not send this letter. We live in a democracy and this council is not absolved of criticism, especially on complex social issues. A letter is not going to change that. From the outside, this letter portrays Burlingame Council as indulging in a petty grievance driven by ego and all of it targeting the API caucus who is actively fighting anti-Asian racism in our communities. Taking up this grievance right now is especially insensitive regardless of anyone's intentions. And finally, I cannot ignore a bit of upsetting irony here, which is that last year when this council had its first public agenda item on districtization because Burlingame Council has never had representation from the Asian Pacific Islanders community, not one council member cared to even acknowledge San Mateo County's history of anti-Asian racism. And yet today, that same council is very quick to call out a leader in our local API community for their, their perspective on Burlingame. I hope you can take a moment of introspection on that. Thank you for listening. Uh, can we have Jordan Grimes, please? Yes, good evening, Council. My name is Jordan Grimes. I'm a lead member of housing advocacy group Peninsula for Everyone, as well as political director of Peninsula Young Democrats. I should start by saying I don't necessarily believe Burlingame to be the single nimbiest city on the peninsula, purely by virtue of the stiff nature of the competition among San Mateo County cities for that title. That said, it's deeply unfortunate that the council is considering sending this letter. It's an incredibly poor taste given the turmoil and pain in the API community right now, and I would urge you to reconsider. Burlingame has a well-known reputation of nimbyism for a reason. That's because it's something the city has routinely and historically engaged in. Contrary to the notion uh, put forward in the letter under consideration tonight, NIMBYism is about far more than just blocking projects. It is also and more emphatically about the rejection of public policies to further housing growth and promote housing equity. In fact, the policies Burlingame has embraced are anything but equitable. Rather than maximize the use of scarce transit adjacent land for affordable housing, the city chose to build a new parking structure, an affront to both the climate crisis as well as lower income residents in dire need of affordable housing. At the conclusion of a years long general plan process, Burlingame chose to ratify and embrace a blueprint that actively plans to fail, envisioning job growth that dwarfs housing growth in the same period, ensuring a continued lopsided jobs housing imbalance over the coming years. Lastly, but most importantly, the policy Burlingame so proudly touts in this letter. Rather than considering zoning the most affluent high resource neighborhoods of the city for gentle density, like duplexes, triplexes, small apartments, or meaningfully upzoning near downtown and Caltrain, the city chose to shunt new multifamily housing to a commercial and industrial area far from adequate services and amenities. This policy was neither equitable nor sensible, rather it is a downright, rather it is downright segregatory. It is quite literally allowing housing to be built anywhere but your backyards. It will very likely run afoul of the duty to affirmatively for house further fair housing and forthcoming guidance from HCD will make this clear. If the NIMBY moniker offends you and it should, I urge you to consider a different course of action rather than sending this letter. 
use the housing element process to re-examine your history, your policies, and work toward creating a city where all can thrive. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Okay, if not, I will close the public comment section and go back to my colleagues. Council Member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you colleagues to listening for listening to my perspective. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, provide enough context of what I believe happened. Um, uh, it, to convince you not to send this letter, it sounds like we have a majority who's, who's willing to unless the public comments have, have uh, made a difference. Look, we're elected officials. We get our feelings hurt all the time. People say things in public comment like they do tonight or at any meetings, any number of panels, next door, you name it. This is par for the course. We don't send out letters, stern letters of rebuttal, particularly letters that are completely out of context for what was actually said. I know what the words said. I hear you, Vice Mayor Ortiz. I know the words mean land use, but in the context of what was being discussed, it was not about land use. I've already said my piece. It was about something really much bigger than that. I fear if we send this letter, people who read it will think differently of Burlingame, but not in the way that we intend. I fear if we send this letter, there will be people who think we are defensive and that we are thin-skinned and, and being petty about this. And I think we need to move on and spend our time on a more important letter, which is supporting the API caucus. That's, that's what I think, thank you. Is there anyone else? Yeah. Vice Mayor Ortiz? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I listened to everybody who's spoken and, um, and uh, I, I am offended and I am hurt as uh, the vice, uh, as council member Beach uh, said it. Uh, and I think at this point, I am convinced that it's a, the timing is wrong for this letter uh, and I were, I'm going to vote against it. Thank you. Council member Colson. So I am a little, what, what's, what's, I think what's, what I'm having a hard time separating it out here and what is sort of, what is bothering about this is that I don't think, I think this letter is a fact-based letter. It just explains, and, and I did speak to numerous people on the API caucus about this and, and, I don't think anybody's calling anyone out or anything. It's just a fact-based letter that, and I, I think somebody said this was a, a um, just looking for the exact words here, um, a complaint that we were lodging a complaint. And I guess I'm, I'm not quite sure where the complaint is in this letter. I think it's just um, a fact-based letter. And I, I'm okay sending along a fact-based letter to, to clarify the position. I do also really understand um, and have worked very closely with the API caucus and, and I understand how they feel. I was just working on a, another county-wide um, policy around diversity, equity, inclusion that specifically did not include Asians in it. And I was a little shocked when I read it at first. Um, so I am sensitive to all the different ten, ten, tenors that are going on. If the letter doesn't get sent, then I, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I feel like I'm upsetting, we, the NIMBYs hate you and the YIMBYs hate you. So you're probably doing a pretty good job walking as fine a line as you can, which is figuring out ways to get housing built that work for your city that is trying to be welcoming and allowing people to move in here at different income levels. And I think each city does have the, the right to figure that out in a way that will work for them and not push their residents away and their constituents away and will bring 
um, people along and move them along. You know, this was a city that, I mean, I ran on a pro affordable housing. Uh, you know, I don't know, if, I, I suppose Emily you're referring to, or council member Beach, you're referring to all of us as establishment candidates. Yes. I don't, yes. I don't, I, I probably, I, I don't think a lot of people ran on a pro affordable housing in this city, probably very often before any of us ever ran because for a lot of different reasons. But the good news is that this council has done the job of moving the ball forward on, on this very, very heavy lift. And I would, I guess what I would say is, uh, you know, yes, these are hard jobs. We get it from both sides. We have to be, you know, we have to listen to everybody. And, but I, I, I don't see anything wrong with sending out a fact-based letter. And if it doesn't go to the API caucus, which it sounds like it probably won't, I'm not sure where Councilman Brownrigg comes down on this, but then I do think it's important to figure out a way to, um, to make sure that this reputation or whatever is changed because I, I don't understand, I, 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 I know we are working hard on a lot of this. And I suppose what I'm hearing from tonight is because we didn't rezone single family dwellings into fourplexes, that that's the problem. And I don't think that is specifically the problem right now. So it'll be a vote of the council. I would still go ahead and send it, but whatever, whatever the pleasure of the council is, is fine with me. So it'll work out. Thank you, uh, Council Member Colson. I, I do have a question actually for the city manager uh, on this letter and, and I will make comments afterward once I get clarification. Uh, through the city manager, do you need a majority to send a letter or can that be just sent um, by council members that agree with the letter? Our practice in the past has been, if you are speaking um, for the city, you need a majority to do it. So we have not had people um, sending, you know, just on behalf of one or two members. Okay. Now, if you wanted to send a letter not on city letterhead, then you could do that. But using city letterhead, it really does need to be three or more members of the council. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so I just want to uh, add a comment. Um, I actually picked up on the person who said this was a complaint. Um, this isn't a complaint. I read the letter. It is factually based. Um, I have had working relationships with former Mayor uh, Wayne Lee in the past, and I knew he was one of the founding mem members of the API, and that is why I put this letter together and showed it to him to see if he was okay with it. Um, and he was. And so that is another reason why I am sending the letter because I did have permission to send the letter. I wanted to make sure he was okay with the information because if he wasn't, then it wouldn't have been done. Um, Burlingham has come a long way. I mean, there was a statement saying, you know, in the past, Burlingame hasn't really done much housing. And that statement is correct. We haven't. Um, but this council and our community with a lot of community engagement uh, have been able to come up with a variety of plans to build housing in Burlingame and be inclusive with that housing. Uh, that is something quite different from Burlingame. Um, than what we've done in the past. And so I do think that we need to represent our city and our Burlingame residents who have worked so hard on the general plan and really moving Burlingame forward from what we've done in the past. And so to me, you know, if we didn't send this letter, then we're agreeing with that statement. And I, and I don't agree with that statement. Uh, and that's why I just wanted to correct the record and just have the facts on paper so that people in, a in the API and anywhere else really know what Burlingame is doing and they don't take that statement that we are the nimbiest city in the peninsula. Um, so I just wanted to kind of finish uh, with that comment. 
Um, Council Member Brownrigg, do you have anything to say? Because I haven't seen you raise your hand. I want to make sure um, that you have the opportunity to speak if you wish to do so. Yeah, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Um, generally, uh, uh, I think we all pay a lot of respect to the mayor for commenting on about our behalves to citizens who email and the rest of it. And um, I try to accord a lot of um, deference to that prerogative, um, and I appreciate it uh, as a general matter. Um, yeah, I've thought long and hard about this. I, I guess I come out with Michelle, Michelle Obama. Uh, when they go low, we go high. I think this letter is better just pocketed and sent to the individual. Um, I didn't appreciate the comments. I don't appreciate a lot of the commentary tonight. I've spent my life fighting for people around the world. Uh, I don't particularly appreciate being lectured about my relationship in the Asian community or people of color. But again, I just choose to ignore it. And I think that's the right thing with this issue. Okay, very good. So um, technically I'm gonna ask uh, if anyone wants to make the motion, so we have the vote on record, uh, and then we'll just go from there, whatever that decision is. So I'll go ahead and make I'll go ahead and make the motion just so that again it's 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 so that we can get it on the record, and um, and I and I and I just also do want to I do want to thank the mayor for sticking up for her constituents and for this council. Um, it's not easy to do in this world. I agree with Councilman Brownrigg that we all, we are all doing a, a very heavy lift and the biggest and best job that we can. And we are not perfect. We're gonna get a lot of it wrong. We're gonna all make mistakes. I make lots of them, lots and lots and lots every day, but we are all trying and we are three women a person of color on this council. This is not a white male majority council. It is a white council, I will agree, for the most part, other, other than Councilman Ortiz. But um, I have always felt like everyone on this council has done a very good job representing as constituents and listening to their issues and coming up um, to the table and trying to work hard on their behalves. Um, so I will go ahead and make the motion and if it, if it fails, it's fine. I, I will also say that as the strategic person who's sitting on the home for all committee, maybe it then becomes my job to, um, work at home for all and do a better job of explaining every time I go to those meetings about the work that we're doing. And I know Mr. Gardner's often with me, um, at those meetings and we obviously need to do a better job of, um, maybe explaining to the community and, um, and, and listening if there's needs that are different in our community than, than what we're hearing from the majority. But thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'll make the motion to accept, uh, to send forth the March 1st letter to the API caucus. And I'll second the motion. Okay, Megan, can we just have a roll call, please? Councilmember Beach? No. Councilmember Colson? Yes. Councilmember Brownrigg? No. Vice Mayor Ortiz? No. Mayor Key or Mayor O'Brien? Yes. Uh, motion fails. Uh, th uh, <laughs> two, uh, three, well, actually, two, three. All right, very good. All right, uh, so next on the agenda, we have a council committee and activities reports. So we have council member Beach's uh, report in there. Is there anyone who wants to add anything? Okay, if not, uh, item number 12, future agenda items. Council member Beach. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to propose and see if there's any other council member who would support considering sending a letter to the API caucus in support of 
um, them at this difficult time when there's so much xenophobia, condemning that and supporting them um, as they're battling so much hatred and, and hate crimes against the API community. Uh, Vice Mayor Ortiz, are you seconding that? Yeah, I am, and it works better when I hit the mute button. So yes, I would absolutely support that. Thank you. All right, then we can put that on a future agenda item. Anything else? Anyone else for a future agenda item? Madam Mayor, uh, if I could, I'd like to explore. We had some recent complaints about the uh, helicopter landings at the uh, hospital here, and, and there was particularly one that was very early morning and it gets very loud. So I don't know if that's something that we can agendize or something that we need to look through uh, public works uh, or, or see what we can do about it because it, it, I've had complaints all of my neighbors here in Ray Park. Uh, through the city attorney and or city manager, is it possible we can get a report from Peninsula Hospital on how many helicopters have been coming in and when and time and all that. So we have some data to look at. We can certainly try to do that. So I haven't seen any of the recent complaints, but this does surface yeah. a, maybe once or twice a year. Um, and there's been a lot of difficulty finding out information and what's approved and what's not and why they're doing what they're doing. But um, we will see what we can do to try to tackle that. There were issues with flight plans, so I would like to have There's that revisit. There's still issues with flight plans and what they're allowed to do, and that's actually had an impact on what the healthcare district is trying to do. Um, so it it it's way more, it's always turned out to be more complicated than we want it to be. But let us go back and figure out what we can bring back to you. Thank okay, you. that would be great. And if anybody, um, so I, the complaints haven't come to me, at least. I don't know if other staff members have received them. So if anyone wants to forward something along, then um, we'll have a little base to go from. I'll, t I'll type my own to the mayor. Uh, are you okay with that, um, Vice Mayor Ortiz, for FYI for right now, and then we can have further discussion if need be? Great. Okay, excellent. Uh, anyone else? All right, so on that note, uh, we have acknowledgements. Does anyone have anybody that they'd like to acknowledge this evening? Okay, I don't see anyone with their hand raised. So then on that note, uh, I just want to remind people that our next council meeting is um, on the 15th of March, but we do have a mid-year budget study session on the 10th of March, which is next Wednesday. And then on that note, I hope everyone has a nice evening. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you.